Hello everyone, and welcome to this workshop with the Everything Procedural Event and Side Effects. My name is Erwin Heims, and I'll be hosting a workshop about massive worlds, how we can craft world partition landscapes in Unreal Engine 5 using Houdini. So first a bit about myself. My name is Erwin Heims. I have been a technical artist at Ubisoft for the past nine years, and I've worked on several major titles, such as Ghost Recon Wildlands, Ghost Recon Breakpoint and Riders Republic. And this year I switched to become a uh, full-time Houdini teacher and procedural pipeline consultant at my own company, eHoudini Academy. Now with that, I released the Procedural Asset Production Masterclass Foundation module, which is released on YouTube, and that's about 50 hours of uh, free Houdini Foundation content. And next to that, I am now a procedural R&D consultant where I consult about pipelines and world building tools for architecture and games. And most recently, I've started working as a part-time senior tech artist at Fracture Labs, where I'm helping them build the game Decimated. More about that in a bit. Now, over the past nine years, I have worked on several different open worlds at Ubisoft, uh, including Ghost Recon Wildlands here. And within Ubisoft, we had our established pipelines, right? So we could craft these massive open worlds. But when I tried to apply this knowledge to the Unreal Engine 5 and create a pipeline within this uh, setup that would allow us to create a world that big, it simply didn't work. With the Unreal Engine 5, there are some new technologies like streaming proxy landscapes, which do allow us to create massive open worlds terrains that are, say, bigger than the previous 8x8 kilometers. But at the same time, Houdini hasn't quite caught up yet. Now, this is being improved, but in the meantime, I wanted to create a pipeline that would allow me to do the types of things that I would have been able to do in the past, right? So in today's workshop, I'm going to explain to you how we can manage this and how we can link Houdini to Unreal to create massive worlds like this, or even much bigger. So let's switch over and let's have a quick look at what this presentation is going to be about and then we're going to go into the workshop. So first, let's go over what the Massive Worlds Toolkit actually is. Then I quickly want to go over the roadmap and some of the feedback that I've received from people who are already using the toolkit. We'll go over how to get the toolkit, how you can get it and how you can install it. And then we'll switch over to the workshop portion, where first I'm gonna go over some of the basics regarding Unreal Streaming Proxy Landscapes and Edit Layers. We'll go over the individual assets that are currently part of the toolkit, and then we're gonna start building our massive world. So at the end of today, you're gonna to have a traversable interactive world that was created using Houdini. So let's get started. Okay, so first, what is the Massive Worlds Toolkit? The Massive Worlds Toolkit is a Houdini-based framework for open-world construction in the Unreal Engine 5. This basically means that this offers you the ability to create landscapes in Unreal, bring them to Houdini, edit them, and then bring them back to Unreal. There are several different tools, and these tools basically complement each other. They link to each other and they can also work with the Houdini height field pipeline. They do all the hard work that's required to translate between Unreal's landscape format and Houdini's height field format. Now, as for what the toolset does, here's a little example. For example, here I have some roads I'm stamping into my terrain. I can apply different material layers. And then when I'm done with that, I can render it out. So. This is just a little sample of the pipeline. I have the ability to specify a folder for my cache, press render, and then the tool will go about rendering out some tiles. And in just a few minutes, we'll have all the tiles that we want to then bring back into Unreal. We can import these, and then we can apply them straight to our terrain. So let's quickly discuss about why I created the Massive Worlds Toolkit. I already explained that there were some issues, but let's go into detail here. So last year, the Unreal Engine 5 was released, and it is still evolving. As such, the Houdini engine is still playing catch up. Now, one of the limitations we have right now is that we are unable to use landscape streaming proxies, which are part of the Unreal Engine 5, 
and its new will partition pipeline and um, use it with the Houdini engine. We're not able to create them at this time. Now this is being improved. Supposedly side effects is gonna release um, an updated Houdini engine with Houdini 20 that does support streaming proxy landscapes, but that's not currently the case, okay? And then next we have the problem that the Houdini engine only creates data, but it doesn't actually update it, right? When the Houdini engine updates something, it tends to remove the old data and then replace it with something new, okay? So when we're dealing with landscapes and we have this big landscape and we have um, vegetation attached to it or road splines embedded into it, right? It will simply replace that landscape or it will create a separate one and then we have to manually delete it. Either way, we're not able to update the existing landscape using the current Houdini engine output. Next to that, the Houdini engine needs landscapes to be plugged into the tool for the tool to be able to see the height field, which is a bit of an issue because if you have a very large streaming proxy landscape, unless you want to plug in, say, individual tiles of the landscape, um, it's going to be very heavy to load this data. So we don't really want to do that because this would quickly blow out our memory load on massive landscapes and that will exceed any PC. Now to solve these problems, I present you with my solution, the Massive World Toolkit. This is basically a Houdini-centric pipeline for open world construction and data management. It's a bi-directional, non-destructive pipeline between Unreal and Houdini, empowered by a couple of Houdini assets that can both run in Houdini and the Houdini engine. It externalizes data for Houdini to read such as landscape tiles and cache files, which means that we don't always need to plug our Unreal assets directly into um, Houdini tools in order for them to see the data. And by doing so, we can cut our memory requirements down, allowing us to load our terrain data for our tools on demand, and only the portion that we actually need to see, without having to plug it into, say, um, an Unreal asset like a landscape actor. And finally, the process that I'm about to present to you is fast, versatile, and procedural. It will allow us to create a large procedural pipeline as the basis for such a pipeline, and we can then expand upon it. So let's have a look at the roadmap and what the toolkit currently contains. So first, like I mentioned, we have a bi-directional lossless pipeline between Houdini and Unreal. This means that we can send landscape data, such as edit layers and material layers, back and forth with minimal data loss. This means that the height field from Unreal, which is a 16-bit grayscale height map, can be transferred to Houdini, edited in Houdini, and then transferred back to Unreal. Or we can edit things in Unreal and then bring that change back to Houdini. Plus, because we can use edit layers, we can delegate certain types of editing, such as procedural editing and manual editing to specific layers to make sure that we don't have any problems with people overriding our procedural results or our procedural results messing with our manual work, right? Now to facilitate this, I've also created a couple of advanced user-friendly height map and material stamping nodes that integrate directly with Houdini's height field workflow. So these nodes have advanced features such as fall off options, as well as compositing options for the Unreal weight blended material layers. Then next, we have the recursive pathfinder and adjacent nodes, which are capable of pathing across the terrain using a realistic slope sensitive pathfinding algorithm. And it's very suitable for rope building because it results in zigzags and nice pathing across the terrain which is very suitable for, say, roads or pathways. And then finally, we have the road editor asset. This tool combines several of the other pathfinding assets that I just showed you, and it allows us to interactively draw and edit our roads and then save them out, incrementally expanding our road network in an interactive method. And because it uses an externalized cache, our data will always be updated regardless if we use it in Unreal or Houdini. And then next, 
I quickly want to discuss some of the plans that I have for the tool set. Um, what I have right now is only the first step. So I have an advanced road post processing feature that I plan to add where I can take the raw curves that are part of the pathfinding result and clean them up. And that will then allow us to create even better looking roads in the world. Now there's already something within this workshop that you can use for this. So part of this is actually part of the workshop. We'll see that in a minute, but I plan to turn this into a proper asset um, that can be configured and easily managed. Next, I want to create a tile based instancing management system so we can place a uh, vegetation or rocks across our world and then split it up into tile caches that can be easily loaded and updated. I also want to make a couple of tunnel and bridge tools, um, simple tools that will allow us to use the road network that we've crafted. And then finally, I'm also thinking about creating a couple of additional um, procedural terrain stamps, something for say mountains or valleys, maybe something for rivers. Basically, more general tools for shaping our terrain procedurally within Houdini with minimal effort. Of course, there's also other improvements that I want to apply, but you know, we'll get to that as the toolset gets developed and used. I will be using your feedback, if you have any, um, to improve the toolset over time. Speaking of feedback, here we have Oscar Mateos. He's the Houdini artist at Fracture Labs, and I'm working with him to integrate the toolset into their pipeline. And he said to me the following, that this is a complete overhaul of how terrains of this magnitude are generated and allows you to have a solid foundation on which to start developing your tools. So go ahead and read this if you want, but let me quickly show you what the toolset is gonna be used for within Fracture Labs. So let me present to you Decimated. So Decimated is a multiplayer online role-playing game set in a cyberpunk world, and it will be using the Massive Worlds Toolkit in order to create the large open world landscape that they plan to use for their open world survival. At the moment, I don't have any footage from the game itself using the toolset, but I do have this trailer. So let me quickly show you what the game is about. So yeah, that's pretty awesome, right? Um, the game is getting along and we're currently working on our alpha release. Um, and we are actually looking for additional Houdini technical artists. So if you're looking for a remote full-time freelance position and you are a world building focused Houdini technical artist, you can go to the decimated.net jobs page 
check out their offerings. Or you can send me an email at erwin at decimate.net if you are interested in the uh, position. But all right, let's continue. I wanted to quickly you know, plug the game, but let's continue on and talk about how you can actually get access to the Massive Worlds Toolkit and the Workshop. So first, in order to get access to the Massive Worlds Toolkit, you can subscribe to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash erwinheims. And if you subscribe to the second tier, the invested tier, um, you can get access to the toolkit. Look for a pinned post called Massive Worlds Toolkit, and this will allow you to get access to the tools. Now, these tools currently are released as black box HDA assets for Patreon backers. Um, this basically means that you are able to use the tools, but you're not able to look inside of them or edit them. This is done intentionally because I spend a lot of time on the tool set um, and I actually intend to make this a proper product. So if you are actually interested in full access HDA licensing, you can also talk to me. But don't worry, even as black box assets, the tools are completely functional. They have been rigorously tested and you can use them for your own personal projects or for making your own indie games, for example, um, or your games as a game studio. Now, just a little bit about the um, patron tier. If you get the HRO tier or higher, you get access to the toolkit and any follow-up updates that I plan to do. Plus, I've also scheduled some live streams, which will explain how the toolkit actually works. So I will go into its inner workings. I've already posted several blog posts um, where you can read about some of the challenges that I had to go through to develop the toolset up to this point. And you'll get access to the Discord for feedback, questions, and live updates. Now next, as for the workshop files, this is the Unreal files and the um, Houdini workshop file. So you can get access to those from the link in the description below. It's a 2.8 gigabyte download, and it will include the Houdini workshop scene, the Unreal project, as well as some of the um, example cache files like our tile cache and our road curve cache. So basically everything you need in order to get started. Okay, so in order to get started, let's make sure Unreal is booted up. I know it takes a while to you know compute shaders and start the program, so let's do that first and then we'll finish up the slides. So if you have downloaded the WAR files, you will get them here, right? You can unzip them and they will come with the HDA assets. So these ones and also the workshop files. Now the workshop files contain all our Houdini centric files as well as the Houdini hip file. So go ahead and start that one up. And then if you open up Unreal, you can just start the project right there. You will get this scene and then you want to go to the content maps folder and then just start up the level. Now it might take a while to load the shaders. So in the meantime, um, you can boot up Houdini as well. We can go to the Houdini file and then boot that one up as well. And this will bring you into this scene. Okay, cool. Now as for the HDAs, you want to unzip them. And I suggest, at least for simplicity, um, you drop them into the documents Houdini 19.5 OTLs folder. I mean, that way Houdini will always see them. Instead of having to mess with the environment variables or setting our scan path, this will be the most painless way to make sure everything is installed where it has to be. Okay, so just go to my documents, Houdini 19.5 or 20, or whatever version you have, go to OTLs and then drop them in there. So first, I quickly want to talk about two things that are new in Unreal Engine 5, which is landscape streaming proxies and edit layers. If we talk about the old school landscape actors, the standard landscape actor that you'll find in older versions of Unreal is basically a simple terrain object that holds one set of height maps for up to um, 8K pixel terrains. It doesn't really go bigger than that. The moment you go bigger than that, you need to reduce your components and well, it's kind of a hard limit. Then this used to work with levels to stream in and out tiles using the old world composition system, but this is no longer supported. 
and in world partition maps levels can't even be loaded right the levels option is just disabled in a world partition map now when you tile these landscape actors um, you can only edit one landscape at a time and in between the tiles you'll generally have some kind of seam right you'll have to overlap them and it looks a little bad it, it's not the best workflow anyway now the Houdini engine can generate these landscape objects because they're not streaming proxy objects um, but it will always regenerate them from scratch um, and finally well standard landscape objects don't even properly stream in and out using world partition so this is the old method let's go to the new one so landscape streaming proxies are basically a landscape actor that contains multiple streaming proxy subcomponents inside of it and these together form a virtual texture height map that encapsulates our entire terrain so i'm basically talking about this where we have a big landscape comprised out of multiple different tiles now streaming proxy landscapes act as a whole and that means that all the tiles in a streaming proxy landscape belong to the same landscape but they're stored as separate files inside the landscape object now i do want to avoid going too deep into this topic but world partition systems basically allow you to stream in and out these streaming proxy objects dynamically they are loaded in or out depending on the distance to the player and if they are too far away like let's say i'm standing here and the tiles back here are outside of my range they will be unloaded and instead the system will replace them with h lots now i'm going to go into that topic right now but the main benefit is is that this means that we can make our terrain completely scale independent and we can technically make it as big as we want to however loaded tiles still require sufficient memory to view right the virtual texture height map still needs to be loaded into memory and i'm not sure if this is fully optimized yet however regardless of that we are able to edit our streaming proxy landscape um, seamlessly we can edit any part of the terrain and we only have to select the main landscape object right here and then finally while happy is unable to generate um, streaming proxy landscapes at this time like i mentioned before um, support is on the way for supposedly uh, houdini 20. so it's coming and i plan to integrate that with the tool set when it happens and then second we have the unreal edit layers now edit layers basically serve as a way to add additional layers of data additional layered height map data to our landscapes so we can edit specific components of the landscape independently now what that means is that if we have a standard non-edit layer landscape which is at this point no longer the default in unreal 5.1 um, we just have a single height map that describes our terrain but that means that if we edit this we also edit this terrain and if we then bring this back to houdini and back and forth between unreal and houdini uh, we basically be constantly accumulating data into the height map there's no way to undo it so that's a very destructive workflow now with edit layers however we do have the ability to work on separate layers and that means that we can keep all of our houdini related um, terrain stamping to a dedicated procedural layer any other changes we make to our terrain we can then do on the other layers such as a manual painting or keep the original terrain the base layer completely pristine and intact so we can always erase our changes and get back to that state now over here you can see for example that while the original terrain is uh, looking like this these gray textures here are basically additive layers and they get stacked on top of each other so this one gets this one added to it then this one gets added to it and then that one gets added to it and depending on how they add or subtract from the previous layer we get a new result so if our procedural data adds and subtracts some detail here we can stamp in for example a procedural road now let me go into a little bit more detail here um, so unreal's edit layers work in an additive 
method. They allow you to stack information on top of one another. So on the left here, I have the base height map. Um, this one can come from, say, World Machine or um, Gaia, or maybe it was generated in Houdini, right? Um, but we brought that into Unreal, and that's our main terrain. Now, this one spans from 0 to 1, so bottom of the map to the top of the map. The height map cannot go lower or higher than that. And then next to that, we have this post procedural layer, which stacks on top of that one. And it has some additive changes. So if we add this to that map, we get this result. And that might be very useful in case we have, say, a house that we place somewhere, right? So if we want to place a house at a very specific location and we want to have some very custom sculpted terrain there, we can add it to, for example, the post procedural layer for micro handcrafting, for example. Now there is a problem with this additive approach in that if we then start to add data in between the first layer here and the last layer, um, it gets accumulated and it gets offset. So in this case here, I do some procedural editing. Let's say this dark blue line here is some procedural information that we've applied. It looks like this. And as a result, our terrain is now shaped like that. No longer this gray line, but this result here, the colored lines. This does, however, mean that this house is now underground. You know, we just buried our house because our manual change here got offset. Now, my tools do have a compositing system built into them that allow us to resolve these types of conflicts. As a result, we can instruct the tool to keep our manually painted results, keep the maximum result, the minimum result. We can even make it erase any procedural changes if a manual change was already present. So that will allow us to preserve our manually crafted result while still applying our procedural one. So what this means is that the process and export tiles HDA, the main core asset that allows us to import and export our Unreal tile information to and from Houdini. This one contains a compositor and we can set per layer how that layer should respond if a previous layer was updated using some kind of procedural change. Now, I'm not going to go too detailed into this topic. Um, it goes quite deep, but unfortunately, I don't have the time for it in this workshop. So if you have more questions about this, you can check out my blog posts on my Patreon or just go to my Discord and, you know, ask me questions about it. There will be a dedicated channel in the Discord um, for the Massive Worlds Toolkit. So you can always go there. But okay, um, let's quickly have an overview of the individual tools of the toolkit, and then we go into creating our landscape. The first asset that we have is an object level asset, and this one is the uh, Massive World tile gen. You'll find this on the object level of the work scene, and this one can generate blank tiles at your designated landscape size. And you can use this as a starting point to create your landscape in Unreal. We'll do this in a minute, so I'm not going to go too detailed on any of these, but Basically, this one's used to make a start. Then we have the Extract Unreal Landscape and Process and Export node, or PNET. And the PNET node here allows us to take the files that this node has extracted using the Houdini engine. It extracts it to a cache file, and then this one can load that and then allow other tools to use it, for example, stamping in features into the terrain. It can then also be used as the file node in the network to extract the information back out to a tile cache. So this is the main node of the system. Now, in order to load our tiles, in order to utilize them, we have the load layers node. Once we've extracted our data using the PNET node, we can then load those layers in to grab either the height fields at very specific tiles in our landscape, load them on demand, or we can feed another piece of geometry through it to extract the attributes to that geometry. Like say a curve, we can extract the height of a height field and then set the curve height. Then as for manipulating our landscape, we have these two nodes, the weighted height transfer and the blended material transfer. These two allow us to basically stamp several different features onto our landscape, such as the height map or update one of our materials and then 
automatically blend it, right? Automatically apply weight blending. We'll go into more detail on all of this. Here we have the pathfinding nodes. So these are the main nodes for the pathfinder. We have the weighted grid, which creates a grid for the pathfinder to use. A simple asset to allow us to configure our paths for the pathfinder. And then we have the pathfinder itself. And finally, we have the editor. And like I mentioned, the editor combines several of the other assets into one, and this allows us to create an interactive process. Plus, finally, for the workshop, I have this little asset here, which can load the height map, it can load the roads that we've created using the Pathfinder, and then create some barriers on our terrain. Now, I've got more tools to come, but this is what is currently available in the toolset right now. All right, so let's go ahead and build our massive world map. Now, at this point, um, there's one last thing I need to tell you, and that's basically that we want to limit the size of our map based on how much memory we have available. And this is going to differ per person, of course, right? If you have 32 gigabytes of memory, the maximum map you should probably make is an 8x8 kilometer at 1 meter per pixel precision. This basically means that if, uh, you know, we have a terrain of 8x8 kilometers and 1 pixel is 1 meter, that's about the maximum you can get out of a 32 gigabyte memory system. If you scale up your terrain and you go to say two meters per pixel, you can go maybe up to 16 by 16. Okay, but then you'll have a less resolution in your terrain. On the other hand, if you have 64 gigabytes, you can maybe go up to 32 by 32 kilometers at max. But do keep in mind that pushing your memory to the maximum can cause crashes, it can cause instability, maybe loss of data. So, you know, be warned. Now to keep this workshop interactive, um, I recommend that if you have a 32 gigabyte system, you stick to a four by six kilometer map. Okay, the demo map that I've provided is six by eight, and you should be able to load that at least. But if you want to edit it, then maybe stick to these sizes here, just to make sure that you don't run into any crashes or other issues. In general, the rule of thumb is this, if you scale your landscape twice, your memory load increases four times. So likewise, if you downscale it twice, your memory load should decrease exponentially as well. But all right, let's go and move over to Unreal and let's get started with the workshop. So over here, I have the example file in Unreal fully booted up. And if we have a look at it, this is a six by eight kilometer map, like I just mentioned. Um, and it already has some of these assets in it that we can see. There are currently two assets in the work scene, but we don't have the OTLs installed properly. So we need to deal with that first. So over here, you'll find the barrier instancer in the HDA folder, but we won't have the um, extract Unreal landscape asset right there. So we need to install that one. Let's go over to our My Documents folder, find the OTLs folder here. And I want to drag the barrier instancer and the extract Unreal landscape asset into my HDA folder here. Now this should update the asset. If it doesn't, you might get a duplicate. Either way, just delete the old one, keep the new one, and then you want to save it. Now if these installed, um, we should be able to get started. Now this scene already holds quite a lot of interesting things you can check out. Um, basically, it's a fully interactive map. If we want, we can just jump into it. Let's go ahead and start playing from here. And once it's loaded it in, um, yeah, we should be able to start just running around and playing as we want to, right? So this is basically a fully built map and everything was imported using Houdini. Now, let me just go and zoom out a bit here. Now this map contains all kinds of roads. We have a lot of detail here. For example, we got our paths. The grass is nicely excluded. Most of this is based on the material. We have a couple of barriers here. These barriers and the materials are all from Quixel. Um, which is partly the reason that the barriers aren't quite aligned. I was originally using a different asset, but I couldn't share that one. So I had to resolve to this one. But even so, 
um, you can see that the instances are sitting on top of the terrain and they're next to the roads. So they are at least correctly positioned in that regard. Next to that, um, the materials themselves are mostly an auto material, but we do have some, you know, uh, standard materials as well. And we also have some other supportive materials. We'll go over those in a minute. And then for the rest, uh, we have some water, a simple water object and a water volume. So we can somewhat swim if we want to. Uh, most of this map is completely functional, completely functional open world. Now, we're not going to build in this map, but we are going to copy it. So in order to get started, let's go ahead and go over to file, go to save current scene as, and then we want to create a new file here. So I'm going to call this one um, massive worlds. Um, and then in your case, you can name it the size of your world. Uh, but in my case, I'm going to make an eight by six and I'll call this one new map. Okay, so this is basically going to drop us in a copy of this map, but we don't actually want to keep this height field because this is a streaming proxy world. And as a result, we're basically just duplicating our height field. So um, let's go ahead and go to our landscape here. And this one will include all of our streaming proxy tiles. We want to select that. Let's go down the list, shift select everything. And we want to select everything. Make sure you also include the landscape object at the top and then press delete. And this is going to take a moment. And once it's gone, you will still have the landscape actor here. Also go ahead and press delete on that. Just get rid of it. Okay. Now I do have a couple of other props in here. Um, these tunnels and bridges, for example, you can also get rid of those. Those are part of the example map, just some proxy objects I placed. And then for the rest, let's keep the water, but we can hide it for now. So we have the water plane. I'm just going to hide that one. Okay. So here we go. We have a completely blank map. Let's go ahead and save that. Yes, we want to delete all of this. All right, so now we're good. Now, in order to get started, what we want to do is first create our terrain. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this, and we can actually do it using the landscape tool. So if we go there, uh, we go to landscape, we can use new landscape. Now, there is a problem with this, however, that in 5.1, at least, we're unable to create a landscape that's bigger than eight by eight kilometers without first creating an eight by eight kilometer area at max and then appending to it using add. It's a bit cumbersome, actually. Um, I personally prefer to do this using tiles. And that's why I created the tile gen asset in Houdini. This node allows us to create a landscape of tiles, um, export them out to a folder, and then import that into Unreal using the import from file option. And the import from file option can import a terrain of any size. Okay, as long as the tiles that we have are properly named and they're all in their own folder. Okay, the tiles for landscape need to have their own designated folder. So it will know the tile size. So over here, let's go over here and give us a folder where we want to export these to. Um, I'm going to use the hip file because right now our scene file here if we look at it, we'll have a tiles folder right there. This one is for the workshop. These are all the example files for the workshop. We're going to be using our own project folder. So let's go over here. Now, since your own workstation probably has a different file path, let's go ahead and update this one. So we output these tiles to the right location. I'm going to type here dollar sign hip. And if you know Houdini, then you know that this basically leads to the location where your hip file is located. So if we do that and we middle mouse click on this, 
we see that it should point to the current folder where our project is located. And then it's going to pick the tiles folder. So that's this folder here. And then we're going to create a new folder in here called initial tiles. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Then next, let's decide how big our map is going to be and what resolution of tiles we want to use. Now, in the past, Unreal used to use tile sizes of, say, 1009 pixels or maybe 504 pixels. Um, this is no longer the case. Within World Partition tiles, we have different tile sizes, and they're all multiples of 510. So in our case, our landscape is going to be 1020. If you want to make bigger tiles, you can also go with 2040. But uh, in our case, let's stick to this. And then you can set how many tiles you want. Now for this workshop, if you have 64 gigabytes of memory, uh, you can stick to six by eight. If you have 32, maybe go down to four by six, just to make sure that your system doesn't run out of memory or such. Um, you might be able to go up to six by six, but let's stay safe, make sure we don't have any issues during the workshop. And then you can always try going bigger later. You know, we can go up to 16 by 16, with 64 gigabytes of memory, but it will be quite heavy. Now, in case you want to have an even bigger terrain than that, if you have more memory available, go ahead, but maybe it'd be better at that point to just scale up your terrain itself. So you'll have the same amount of tiles, the same amount of pixels, but you'll just be effectively scaling up your terrain to twice or four times the size. You'll have less resolution per meter, but you'll have a bigger terrain, okay? Now, in our case, um, let's stick to our designated sizes. So I'm going to go to six by eight in this case. And let's go ahead and create that. Now I'm going to start with a grayscale texture of zero value. So we're going to create a black texture. And one thing you will have to do, and this should be fine if you've already dropped your OTLs into your Houdini home folder, into your My Documents folder, is have the um, Massive World Tile Gen 1.0 specified down here. If you don't, you'll want to go to that folder and you'll want to specify it. Now with that set up, you can go ahead and click render tiles. And this should pop up the console. And it will tell you that it started rendering out the tiles, that it's in progress, and then when it's completed. When it's completed, it will have output some new tiles. So if we go to our folder over here, we now have our initial tiles. We'll need these if we want to start creating our landscape. So over here in Unreal, let's go ahead and go to the landscape editor. Go to manage, click on new, import from file. And then we want to leave all of this by default for starters such as we want to have edit layers enabled. We do not want to flip the Y axis. I currently do not support that. Um, World Petition grid size will keep at two, and then we can import our height field file. So let's click on this button here. And then we can specify where our height field or our tiles that we just created are located. So I'm gonna go and grab my file path here. And then we can click on any of these tiles, usually I just click on uh, the first one. And what this will do is it will load in those tiles and we will see a wireframe representing the tiles and their components. Um, now, it doesn't matter which tile we clicked on in that folder, as long as we make sure that we only have the tiles that we want to load in this particular folder. If we have anything else in there, it won't know what the size of our landscape is because it basically just checks the size of the texture and then the coordinates to determine how big our landscape is going to be. So in this case, it's going to create a 6,120 by 8,160 pixel landscape. Next, we want to specify what material we want to use. I have provided with the workshop a couple of landscape materials, including a 1K and a 2K version. So if we go to materials, we'll find here the master material, and then we'll find two landscape instances. If you want to have a higher resolution terrain, you can use this one, but just to keep our memory load low for the workshop, let's go ahead and use the 1K version. Landscape will look a little bit less, but 
it will be easier to load. So go ahead and click on this one, M Auto Landscape 1K Instance. Make sure you grab the instance, not the master material, because uh, we won't have all our settings set properly. Then next, make sure it's set to additive mode. We'll just keep it on additive. And then we want to load in our um, layer infos. So we need these in order for Houdini to see the individual materials. If we don't have that plugged in, it won't work. So go ahead and click on this drop down here for each of them and select the layer info that pops up. So we just want to do all of these. Now the only one that won't have a layer info is the uh, visibility layer. Don't worry, that's intentional. Uh, we just want to finish all the ones up down here as well. And these layers are um, different. They don't actually have a material, except for this one. Don't worry, that's also intentional. And then down here, we have all the settings that basically determine how big our landscape is. Now it's gonna tell us that the resolution is uh, one pixel more than the numbers that we had up here. That's actually intentional. This is the pixel count. This is the vertex count. The vertex basically means the corners of a pixel. That's a problem I had to solve in order to make this entire tool set work. But that aside, over here we have the size of our terrain. Now we do wanna tweak this. The first and most important one is the height of our landscape. So by default, an Unreal landscape is only gonna have 512 meters of height. So normally 100 scale is 512 height. In this case, I would like to create a terrain that exceeds that. So I'm gonna scale this up to 200 and that will make our terrain 1024 high. Now notice how our terrain just sunk down and that's because Unreal landscapes are always centered around the middle of their landscape container. Okay, so if we make this smaller, then the bottom of our landscape actually raises up. We cannot exceed the minimum or maximum height of the terrain. So we wanna set this properly ahead of time or we'll run into some problems later. In my case, I want to set the 200 and that means we have a 1024 high terrain. Now, in order to make sure that our terrain is actually sitting on top of the grid and not below the grid, I'm going to raise it up. So I'm going to take my location in Z and I'm going to set this to 51200. That's basically half of our height map range. So if our height is uh, 1024, then our offset should be 512. Of course, Unreal works in centimeters, so we add two extra zeros to that, right? So it becomes this. So now our terrain will be sitting right on the grid, at least when it's flat with height zero. Now um, we could go with this, but I don't want to lose too much time. So I just want you to focus on this here. Notice how the height map, or at least the grid outline of it, is actually bigger than our volume here. This volume was exactly the size of our original terrain. And that's because when we load in our terrain, it's actually imported at pixel scale. So right now our terrain is actually, instead of six kilometers by eight kilometers, just slightly bigger than that. Now I don't want that. I would like each of my tiles to be exactly one by one kilometer. So let's go ahead and change that down here. Now, if we were to use my import tool, it will actually tell you the exact size we want to give it. But it takes a little bit of time to update an existing terrain, just memory wise and update time. So I'm gonna set my values here and I'll just show you that in a minute. Let's go ahead and set this to 98.039215. So 98.039215. And we want to feed that into both the X and Y channels. And this will scale our entire landscape down just slightly squish the pixel size down so that it ends up inside the exact six by eight kilometer area. If we keep our location set to zero, zero, and then the right height, then everything should be good and we should be able to create our terrain. 
So let's go ahead and click import. And then if we have our layer set, our material set, and our scale set correctly, we should have a good terrain to start with. Now, loading this is going to take a little bit of time. Um, I'm just going to skip to the point where it's loaded it in, and then we'll continue from there. Okay, so here's our terrain. Um, if it's showing you graphics errors like this, that actually can happen. This is not actually a real issue. This is just a graphics glitch in the virtual height map. So we can ignore that. But basically here we have our terrain. It's completely black because we currently have no materials applied. We'll sort that out in a minute. But first, before we do anything, let's go ahead and save. It's always a good idea to save your terrain before you go back to um, any other mode. And as you see, it just updated the virtual texture, uh, the virtual height map, and that means now everything is fine. It was just a graphics thing. Now, the first thing I want to do here is update my layers because I don't just want to have one layer. We have edit layers enabled and we can actually have more than one. So let's go over here and rename the first layer to base layer. All right. Then we're going to click this and click create. We're going to add another one. So this one is going to be our macro layer. Then next, let's go ahead and create a third layer. And we'll rename this one to procedural layer. That's going to be the layer where we write all of our data in our Houdini procedural layer. And then finally, let's create the last layer called micro layer. Now, just to give you a quick overview of what I intend to do with this. The base layer is the layer where we store our main terrain height map in. This is the base layer. We don't want to touch this one for sculpting the height. Okay. Now it's easy to make mistakes here when you're using this. So normally I lock my layers, make sure I only write to the ones I actually want to write to. But basically the base layer is where we put, say, our Gaia terrain or our world machine terrain or whatever we originally generated with Houdini. Then our macro layer is where we make major terrain changes that are hand sculpted. If we want to sculpt in a river or add a mountain or something, we put it there. This is still also mostly a manual process, though we could use Houdini to add, say, detail in here, but it's not something we're going to be updating all the time. Then the next layer is our procedural layer. We'll be writing our procedural changes in here, carving our roads, maybe um, any other stamping that we want to do, but something that's going to be replaced all the time. And then finally, we have our micro layer. And the micro layer is where our artists are going to do their micro sculpting, you know, like change the terrain around the house, like make little tweaks. But basically every layer, every subsequent layer should have less and less uh, height difference compared to the layer before. And in general, the base layer can hold the entire height map range from zero to say in this case, 1024 high, but the macro procedural and micro layer are additive and they can only add or subtract half of that height map. So if the terrain is 1024 high, then these three layers can only add or remove half of that, 512. So if these layers create it, let's go ahead and save this again. And now our terrain is ready to be exported out to Houdini. It's completely black, which means that none of our materials are currently applied, but we'll deal with that in a minute. Now there's one thing I quickly want to point out is that when we apply our height differences, we'll be applying it to any of these layers, basically the layer that we want to use, right? So if we want to write our height into the base layer, we stamp it into the base layer. If we want to write some procedural information that we constantly replace, we use the procedural layer. But our materials don't work that way. Currently, Houdini cannot read materials on different layers. It can only read it from, well, all layers combined, as if they were one layer flattened together. And secondly, um, weight blended 
um, materials don't actually work properly when you apply them to different layers anyway. So we only want to apply our materials to the base layer, right? So it's always a good practice to lock the layer. You don't want to edit, do your sculpting, save it. Basically just make sure you don't write data into the wrong layer. That's the main advice. Okay, so let's bring this into Houdini. So let's go up here. And uh, since I've saved, right, we can go and save that. Go to selection mode. Let's bring up our uh, detail panel here. And I am going to grab this extract Unreal landscape node that we have here. Um, and I'm going to, well, delete it because that was the old one. We want to replace it with a new one. Let's go to our HDA folder. And if you've already imported this, good. You can right click it, then go to instantiate at the origin. And you might have to start up your Houdini engine. Um, incidentally, you should have Unreal 5.1.1 at least. And the latest version of Houdini that I'm running is um, 19.5534. Make sure you have the Houdini engine installed. And if everything's working properly, then, well, you should get this. So now in the center of the map, our tool has appeared. So let's go over there. And if you notice your scrolling is a bit slow, just set it to speed eight because this terrain gets kind of big so we can navigate out easy. Um, now, as you can see, we have some readout here. And the main thing it says right now is that it's missing a landscape input and there's nothing to configure. Next to that, we have a guide, a couple of instructions and some notes about landscapes. Um, since we made a copy of our current world, uh, something to note here is that you should probably use the open world template if you are actually using a new level. So if you say new level, you want to use this one because the open world is already pre-configured with um, world partition and uh, one object, one file, and everything you need to make this work. So just a little tip. And next to that, we have some information about uh, scales. Now let's have a look here. If we click on the tool and we click on the asset here, we can scroll down and there are a couple of options we have available. So first we have the tool. We have the input for the landscape. We we'll want to plug that in in a minute. Then we have the configuration that we need to set. And then we have the output. And these options down here are for the visualizer and some debug options. So you can ignore these for now. And the next we have the guide and the guide is basically just me giving you a little readout similar to this it lines up um, what you can do how you can use the tool but i'm going to explain this here so let's go to the tool um, the first thing i would like to do is set the height value for the terrain because we know our terrain is at a scale of 200 so we want to set that here also to 200 so the tool knows that the terrain is going to be 1024 meters high Next, we want to set our per pixel precision and our tile size. Now, when we exported our tiles, we were using 1020 pixels. And um, we want to make sure that we set that correctly here as well. Now, if we want to have one meter pixel precision, about one meter, we can use our default setting. If you want to have double the pixel precision or basically a higher resolution of your landscape, more detail, you can use this. But of course, that will exponentially increase your memory load. Alternatively, if you want to use less memory or have a larger landscape for the same amount of memory, you can use two meter or four meter pixel precision. And then the tool will give you corresponding values when it's taken in the landscape. As for our tile size, we are using 1000 meter sized tiles. So that's what we'll set here. All right, then let's go ahead and plug in our landscape. We're going to go up to landscape input, go to landscape selection, and we're going to grab our landscape object at the very top. Basically, it will show you every single landscape streaming proxy, every individual little square here. But what we want to grab is this guy, the landscape object. So if we go to our tool, we can then select it right here. And this is going to take a while. 
Um, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about that. It simply means that Houdini has to load in the landscape and save it to memory. This is also one of the reasons that you want to have a decent amount of memory available because we do have to load the entire landscape all at once for Houdini to see it. If you are using will partition, you can use the will partition system to load only a part of the map and that will reduce your memory load. But the moment you want to import this back into Houdini, we do need to load the entire terrain. You can hide everything else, right? You can hide all the other data layers in will partition, but you have to have the terrain fully displayed. So I'm going to skip forward here until it's loaded. It should take about a minute or so. So as you can see, it's now loaded in properly. Let me um, go to full screen. So as you can see, we now have a big blue outline around our terrain. We basically want to make sure that the blue outline and the red outline are aligned. The red area needs to be inside the blue area. And normally the red area indicates the height of our terrain, but if there's no height in the height map, it just thinks of it as a grayscale value. So it, it picks the middle value. Um, that's why it thinks right now the terrain is uh, this high. That's basically just how Houdini imports the terrain from Unreal. So until we actually have some height in this terrain, I cannot properly figure out the height. Um, but besides that, we get some readout down here. So in the corners, you will find the path that it wants to save it to. We'll fix that. It will currently default to our uh, Unreal Engine folder. Um, next, we have the statistics from the terrain. So we can see here that's the resolution of the actual streaming proxy landscape. We have the tile size that we've set. And then over here, we have our configured data. So if this is all set up properly, then down here in the second section, it will tell you the exact size and location that your terrain has to have. Let me go over here and show you. Let me scroll up. Then over here, you will get these settings. So we already set the scale and the height, as well as the offset in wheel position here. And then next to that, it has um, automatically specified the uh, location. Now, this should be okay for us. We don't really have to round it off, but if you want, you can. Basically, we need to make sure that the landscape's corner, way over there, is at the correct position, so the landscape is centered on our grid, because that's how my tool expects it. It needs it to be centered. Um, now, overall, this should be okay, so we're gonna go with that. And then we can go back to our tool. Now you'll notice that um, we also have some layers here. These are the layers that we fed into our landscape. We have our base layer, macro, procedural, and micro, and it's detecting them in that order. So you should have it like that. If you don't, then you'll have to update that on the landscape. So down here in the tool, let's go ahead and update our export path. Um, I'm gonna go to my folder, the main folder for our workshop. And over here, you'll find the landscape exports folder. Um, we basically want to grab this one. So I'm just going to grab the file path from that and click these dots, plug it up in here, select folder. And well, that should update it. Sometimes if you just paste it in there, it doesn't always work. So I notice you want to use these dots for it to properly catch or it tends to reset it. Um, then next, we want to set the name of our output. So in this case, our previous one was called workshop. Uh, in our case, I'm going to change this to Massive Worlds Workshop New Map and enter. And then we have append stats to file name. And you'll notice here on the readout that what that means is that it's basically going to add the size of the landscape to the end of the file so it's easier to recognize okay so with that we can now export it so let's go to the tool so we can click on this button click on save and now it should have output a file for us now here you can see in our landscape exports folder we now have this cache file it's a very small file right now because our landscape has no height information and as such, it's basically just compressed it. So there is no information to sample. But what it does have is an exact 
dimension of the terrain and a lot of additional stats that we've set. So we can use that in our PNET tool to import it into Houdini. And let's go ahead and generate a terrain for ourselves. So we can actually bring this into Unreal and have something to play with. So I'm gonna go to Houdini. And here we have our workshop file. So we just worked with the tile generator. Let's hide that one. And let's go to the work scene. So let me just quickly show you what we have here. So we are going to start with the landscape generation over here. So we're gonna bring in our terrain and then generate a little landscape and then output it again so we can bring it to Unreal. Then after that, once we have that, we can bring it back to Houdini. We can save out some files and then we can start building a road network using that. Over here, we have the Pathfinder setup in a raw form. And here we have the editor setup that uses these same nodes internally. So we'll go over this quickly and then we can build some roads for our landscape. And then finally, we'll deal with this here, which is the output. So we'll load in our terrain as is. We'll stamp in some new details and then we'll stamp back out the new tiles, okay? All right, so let's start up with this here. That will give us a basic understanding of how this process works. All right, so first here at the top, we have our import option, uh, our import PNET node, the process and export tiles node. And like I said, this is the core node of the uh, system. So if I just go up top here, it's currently in import mode. Now, um, something you need to know about the PNET nodes is that just like with the um, tile generator, you want to make sure you have the file path for the PNET locked core asset set up here. If that's not set up, then the rendering system won't work. So make sure this file path is correct for you, and then we can continue. You want to do that for every PNET node you want to render something out with, but okay. So up here, we have the import mode currently enabled. We also have the composite and export mode. And this one is specifically if we have already stamped something into our height field, and then we want to export that back out. Then next down here, we have our current layers. Now, um, what I'll do is I'll flush these. Let's go ahead and just render this one. And right now this is rendering some blank data that already came by default with our workshop file. We have now created a new file, so instead let's load that one in. Let's go up here, select that, and that will switch it out. Now it's not gonna change anything because we basically exported a landscape with the same landscape material and the same um, landscape edit layers, so there's nothing to change. But if I were to clear these, then the tool will try to assume how your landscape is generated. Um, in general, when you click on this button, it will do that for you and it will populate these menus. So what is this for? Well, by default, the landscape will have some data in it. That's the file that we exported. And it will include information about the landscape, such as its size, the resolution, uh, the tile size, and the per pixel scale that we've set. Now, if we click on this button, then it will populate these configuration menus down here. And by default, you don't want to mess with that. This should be set up correctly. Unless you have additional edit layers that you don't want, um, you should be able to just leave this alone. Then for the materials, same thing. It will load in all the materials that have a layer info set on them in Unreal. If there's no layer info assigned, Houdini can't see them. So you need to make sure they're all assigned. Now, there are a couple of layers in here that in Unreal are no weight blended. So if I go to Unreal, go to my landscape, and then I go to painting, then at the bottom you'll see here a couple of layers that say no weight blending. Now normally weight blending means that these layers accumulate and they all have an influence, like a percentage, but it always has to add up to 100%. So if this one here, the snow, for example, has 50%, then the other materials only have 50% to distribute among themselves in order to do the blending. No way blended materials don't care, and they can have a value from zero to 100 influence independently from one another. I'll explain that a bit more in a bit when we do some uh, material stamping. But basically, 
what we have to do here now is make sure that we set for the materials that have no weight enabled these toggles so we want to disable it on the remove grass layer the darken layer the procedural dirt road and the remove auto snow if that's set up then now the material nodes that follow in this network the um, blended material transfer nodes they will now know that these layers should not be considered when it does the auto blending okay so the next part about this node let me just minimize this so the next part here is the preview system this allows us to preview any of the layers that we currently have inside the pnet node this can be layers that were imported from Unreal using the uh, import cache or data that was coming from uh, our export feature down here. So if we look at this right now, we have several layers available, including some of them that were generated by this node. Um, I'm not going to go fully into that right now because we have no data to export, but these are basically the layers that are set up down here in our layers to render. You can actually preview those before you render them out. We'll get back to that later. We can also specify uh, how we want to preview our terrain. Right now I'm viewing the whole landscape. So the entire landscape here. Or you can view it as individual tiles, in which case you can specify the tile number. And if we zoom in a bit, we can see that we have the tile numbers here, plus the coordinate of the tile. Now this can be useful if our terrain gets really big and we have a lot of data to view. So it'll be a bit faster and memory efficient. Now the last part here that I want to cover right now is the output layer for edit. If we're inside the import mode, the tool will output the landscape from the second output here. So we can actually start editing it. Now um, the preview mode is completely uh, separate from that. This just allows you to view the data, but the data comes out here will always be the full data set. So if we look at that, we have a lot of our layers available right here. Now, the layer that we are editing is the layer that will be edited. And then when we export it out, that's the one that we're going to apply all of our processing to. So if we are editing the base layer, we're basically updating that layer when we output export. And if we have some compositing enabled, then that might also affect subsequent layers. But right now we are not using that. We don't have anything to composite, right? All right. Now, if we were to write into another layer, like say the procedural layer, on the other hand, um, then it will allow you to purge that layer as well, which basically means that it won't keep any of the data that was already in the layer to begin with. If you don't have this tagged, it will allow you to accumulate data to that layer. Otherwise, it will replace the layer if you have purge tagged. At the moment, we want to export to the base layer. So let's make sure we stay on there, right? We want to create our base terrain first. All right, so let's go ahead and generate the landscape. Now, I'm not going to take too much time on this. Um, I'm going to skip through some of the computation here. To quickly give you an explanation, make sure you have the base layer set. Then we go down here to the high field noise. And this one will apply a bit of a noise pattern to our terrain. Now the Perlin noise works quite well for some simple mountains and um, quite broad valleys, but you can also maybe switch to simplex noise and that will create more broader mountain ranges and some more smoother valleys in below, down below. So if you want, you can use that. In my case, I'm actually gonna do that as well. You can also change the scale or the offset if you want to get something different maybe offset your terrain a bit. In general, just pick what you think looks good for you. Um, and then we're going to continue on. Now down here, it's going to extract out the height and the mask layer from all the other layers. I suggest you don't render this one because without the height or the mask layer, height fields become standard volumes and they become quite heavy to view. And that can occasionally crash my PC. So I'm not going to do that. Usually it's fine. There's no data in them as well at the moment, so it might be okay. 
but I'm not going to risk it. Um, then we have our height range. Now this is going to remap our height range to be between, in this case, um, 5 and 750. We want to make sure we compute the height range though, because otherwise we won't have a correct height evaluation here. And that should give us a decent height range for our terrain. So we go with that. Then next, uh, we do a couple of options here to add some detail. This takes our valleys and it adds a little bit of um, slump to it. We'll create some nice muddy areas at the bottom of our terrain, some accumulations of dirt in the valleys. And if you want, you can change some of the settings here to, um, sorry, here to change where it should stop that. So maybe we can set this to 300 and that will make the slump go just a bit higher like that. Um, next, we have the height field erode. Now, in my case, I have de-rezzed my terrain. I've actually reduced its quality a little bit, which does result in a slightly lower resolution terrain, mind you. We do lose a little bit of our quality, but the uh, erosion will add a lot back as well. But it's going to take a while to compute, so I'm going to use this node, and then when it's done, I'm going to come back. Now, in case you don't want to do that, you can also use this file node over here. It will default to it because by default it should point to a file here in our cache. We go over here in the stash folder. I have this BGO node. This is basically my demo height field from the um, example project. And you can just load that one in instead and then you can continue with that if you don't want to or you cannot, for some reason, compute the erosion. For me, it's going to take about five minutes to compute this, so I'll get back to you when it's done. Okay, so it seems to have finished. So now we can see here we have our erosion. Um, like I said, you can go ahead and use the file that I provided, or you can go ahead and compute it, but it will take some time. So when we have this, we can continue on. Now, I do suggest that if you want to keep it, uh, you save it out. So. I'm going to save it out to a new stash file here, click save, and then if you want to make sure you don't have to recook it every time, uh, it should update this here. So now we are loading this file instead. All right, so moving further down, uh, down here, it's going to do a little bit of uh, playing around with the brown areas, which are the sediment areas. Uh, in general, they're a bit noisy, so I smooth them out a bit. So we go down the list. As you can see, that smooths them out just a bit. Then over here, I want to take the borders of my map and I want to flatten them out. And this is just to make sure we don't get any light leakage when we have in Unreal, our terrain. Because normally if light comes in from the side of our terrain and it shines through the bottom of our terrain somewhere, like from a mountain to a valley, um, we're gonna have weird lighting. So by taking the borders of our terrain, just this edge, and we use a little vec script, to grab every voxel that's right on the edge and just push it down to height zero. So that will flatten everything out. Then we go ahead and uh, merge it back together. Also notice that before we did this, I have actually restored the resolution of our terrain back to full resolution. So this one here is actually linked up to the resolution node up there, just to make sure that we keep the same resolution of our height map as the other data that we have in this stream. So once merged, we now should have all our layers together. And something of note is that these layers actually have attributes in them, and they come from the PNET node. So if we look at that quickly, and we just look at the data here, there are some point attributes and some detail attributes that describe basic information about the landscape. But for the individual layers, we have a lot more data, including the layer type, which describes if it's a mask, if it's the original height state of the terrain, the height map itself. In this case, we have a copy of it in the sediment. We have to delete that. Then we have the edit layers, which are states 0, 1, 2, and 3. In this case, these are the uh, layers that we have for the base layer, macro, procedural, and micro. Then we have the material layers, known as four. So these are all the material layers. And then we have the visibility layer at five. So 
this identifies the layers. You have to make sure that you set this up correctly. If you start adding your own layers in or you start editing these things, you have to respect this information here, including some of these other stats. Otherwise, the tool won't quite know what the layer is and, well, it's going to cause problems. Anyway, going further down, um, next, let's go ahead and apply a couple of materials. Now, the next node in our list here is the blended material transfer. And by default, the blended material transfer node is going to use the first material that it finds in our list. So notice how these materials are sorted. This is the same sorting order that you get in the input options of our material configuration here. And that should also be the same order that they provided to you in Unreal if we go to this list here. So that's quite useful. That's the same order. Now note that the first material specified is going to be the base material. And whenever there is no material present, the um, blended material transfer, assuming it's a weighted material, mind you, is going to assign that particular material to full 100%. And if, if it doesn't add up to 100%, it's going to add into that material the remaining percentage that it's missing. Okay, Just to make sure that all the material layers together add up to 100% influence. So let's go ahead and uh, try this one out. So at the moment, I have this desert mask here. And this is basically just a, um, it's, it's a curve, right? So if we want to, we can tweak this terrain out a bit. Now, I do suggest you are careful here. We can use a convert height field node. Make sure you set this one to a low number, like 0.01. Don't keep it on one because we don't want to render out the full precision height map. That's going to probably either crash your PC or take a long time to compute. Maybe we can boost it up to 0.1. Okay, that gives us a little bit of a representation of our terrain. And then we can specify maybe where we want some of our deserts to go, right? So the way how this works is we have by default a auto material on our terrain called auto forest. If we want to apply our desert somewhere, which is auto desert, it's going to swap out between that one. And then this entire system is going to apply a couple of other layers as well. So in our case, I would like to specify a couple of nice places for deserts in our map. Maybe this corner here would be nice, a little mountainous, maybe, uh, maybe this section here. So I'm just going to reset my brush and maybe just paint this in. We can snap it to the grid so we get some nice positioning going on. Quickly just designating a zone. I like to stay away from the mountains too much. I don't want to go to the top of a mountain. But just, you know, somewhere around here should do. Um, and then, like I said, maybe we pick somewhere in the middle, like maybe this zone. All right, so once we're done with that, uh, we can use a height field project to project it to the height field. And then we use this setup here to blur it. Then we can apply that as a layer mask into our blended material transfer node. Now you can also apply this mask from the other input, but then you have to set this one here over to input one. So right now we're using a secondary input with the same resolution to get the mask. And we're currently applying the uh, auto material here. Now, another thing we're doing is we're applying it at max, which is the default setting. And max basically means that the um, material is going to blend with an existing material and it's gonna keep the maximum value. We can also replace it if we just want to completely wipe the original material from that layer and then uh, replace it with a new one. We can add, we can subtract, or we can simply say we want to just flood the material, which means everything gets set to one, at which case it will look like that. It won't even use the mask at that point, or we can erase it. Now we're going to keep it on max. 
And then over here we have output as a mask. So if you have this tagged, then it will output as a mask right here. You will see what it looks like. Um, and finally, we have the ability to stamp the intensity. Now, right now I'm stamping it at an intensity of 1.0, meaning it's gonna just stamp it between zero and 100% range. Now, um, if you want to know more about this, you can read this or the help file. But basically, if we limit our stamping range, then any other materials that are present underneath are going to be suppressed, but never fully erased. Or at the very least, they can be erased if they are too low, like if they were already really low to begin with. But the general idea here is that if in Unreal we were to erase this layer, then whatever other layers were underneath before, and they're gonna be returned back to their original values. So you can use this or custom intensity if you want to set that. In this case, if we were to set, say, a custom intensity to say 0.5, then you'll notice that everything becomes more um, pale like that. So it won't have as much influence. I'm gonna, not gonna do that here, keep it on one. And then next, um, we have a couple of other masks that we're gonna apply. Um, we're gonna apply a darken layer over here, which basically takes the existing material on terrain. This is a no weight blended layer. So it doesn't blend with anything else. But if we apply this, then we're gonna add a little bit of darkness, a little bit of darkening of the terrain material around the hills, around the um, the sediment, the areas where the, uh, the flow map basically went, the erosion. And then next, I would like to remove all my snow in the areas of the desert, because I don't really want there to be snow right next to the desert. So that's another layer. It's called remove auto snow, and that one will become applied. And there's a little bit of noise in it as well. It's coming from over here. And then next, let's add a little landmark feature into our terrain, right? So over here, I have a Houdini icon. If I display that, Control shift that, and we'll show it up right there. Now, let's go find a nice place for this uh, shape. Maybe we put it on top of a mountain somewhere or in a valley, maybe on top of this mountain there. So I'm going to grab this transform, grab it and drag it over. And what this is going to do, if we feed it into our weighted height transfer node here, it is going to um, change the height of our terrain and blend it with this shape. So if we put it somewhere on this mountaintop maybe, or just in this valley perhaps, let's rotate it a bit, something like that, that's gonna look quite nice. So let's feed that, this mesh, into our weighted height transfer. Now this node has two modes. It has an advanced mode and a simple mode. Now the simple mode is simply gonna take the shape that we have here, grab the nearest voxels near it, and it's gonna do a, a bit of a fall off transfer to it. So if we click on that, you can see, it now blends the terrain towards it. And that already looks quite interesting. Um, now we also have an advanced mode, but this geometry doesn't have enough detail. So we'll get back to that later when we stamp our roads into the terrain. But basically we can change the fall off here if we want to, we can make it longer. And this means that our shape is gonna blend even more into the, into the mountainside, right? Maybe let's pick something like 35. If you want, you can also output this as a mask as well, or as a, another layer, um, so we can use it later. And then finally, let's use this and apply a material as well. So I want to have a custom material on the top of this to really make it pop, really stand out. Okay, so this is basically going to apply that material. Now notice I have this node here, this um, built material mask. This basically takes my mesh, uh, projects it onto the current height field we have here as a mask, does a little bit of blurring. This is not one of the um, Massive Worlds nodes, but it's just a simple node setup to transfer this shape to a height field as a mask and then bring it in. It's very similar to how you would normally do a height field workflow, so let's go with that. 
And then once we have that, we can now go ahead and export it. Okay, so now we have our data, we have our terrain. Um, at this point, the PNET node is gonna start compositing all of these layers together. And when it's done, it should give us this. So in export mode, the tool actually has a couple of additional options here for compositing. Like I mentioned previously in the slides, um, we can composite together the other layers if a previous layer had a change. I'm not gonna go into detail here right now, but like I said, you can ask me on the Discord. Next to that, um, over here we have our preview again. So now we actually have something to view. So let's have a look. If I click on this, you can see several of our layers, like for example, our darken layer. If we click on that one, we can, and we render it, we can uh, preview this layer and it will show it as a mask, as well as a little bit of height to display. We can also view the individual layers of our landscape. So here we have our base layer right now. Let's hide that. And you can see we've stamped our logo into that actually. Um, then we have our macro layer, procedural layer and micro layer. We have not done anything to these layers just yet. So they're still gonna be just blank, right? We have all our materials. So we have our default forest layer. And notice how the deserts have basically removed that particular layer right there because it's a weight blended layer. But we'll also have this Houdini logo, which has been removed because that's where our custom forest material has been stamped, uh, the forest floor material for the Houdini logo. And if we look at the desert layer, you will see the same. It's basically the opposite because these are basically switching each other out. All right, so with that, there's a couple of other ones that we can look here at the bottom. They are called pre-composite and composite. Now the pre-composite is basically the state of the terrain as it was before we did our stamping. So that's basically a layer that was carried over from our import node, and we can actually export that out as well. This is the state from before. So we can also undo it, right? It's a way to get back to that state or we can view the composite. Now the composite layer is basically a composite of all the layers accumulated on its level and before that level. So right now we only have something that can view the composite base, right? We don't have any data in the other layers, but we can go to the composite post procedural layer. So basically the micro layer, and you'll see that since all the other layers have no difference, this layer still looks like the base layer, but it actually has information, unlike if we look at the individual layer itself, which has none. I hope that makes sense. Uh, basically composites just accumulate the different layers together and allow us to load them in as an individual set of uh, height map tiles. That can be pretty useful. Okay, so at this point, uh, we're ready to render out this terrain. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's not waste too much time here. So over here we have the PDG configuration. Um, this basically means that we can configure how the renderer is gonna be distributed over different processes. So the PDG is the procedural dependency graph in Houdini. It allows us to render out tasks in batches. In this case, what we're gonna do is I'm going to distribute it over um, say about 80 tiles per batch. And then I'm gonna tell it it can use up to 12 cores of my system. I have 16 cores on my PC. If you're not sure how many cores you have, uh, you can keep it on the default one fourth of your total cores. It will just be a lot slower, but in general, just keep it below your maximum cores. You don't want to completely bog down your PC. And then finally, uh, the configuration for the tile output, we're going to keep at default. This is what we need for Unreal, so just leave that alone. And then we can tell it what tiles we actually want to render. Now at the moment, I would like to render out everything. Um, but I want to render it out to the corresponding folders. So keep in mind what you have set here. I'm gonna specify auto output to corresponding folders. And I want to output it to a folder that corresponds to our current project. Now in this case, this is the old workshop folder. I don't want to write to that. I want to write to my new folder, new map. 
So basically, if we look in our folder structure, over here we have our tiles. Then we have the example project, um, Massive Worlds Workshop, which contains all the layers for the example project. But we can also create our own um, folder here for our own project. So let's do that. Let's, let's set this up. And then next, we can specify which layers we want to render. At the moment, I just want to render out everything. OK. Then next, what we can do is we can actually get a diagnostic of what the system is going to render out and where it's going to send it to before we actually go ahead and render our tiles out. So let's click on that first, and then we can click on Render Tiles. And by doing that, it should pop up the console and it will tell you a pre-render diagnostic has been sent out. This is our render path right here. And these are the layers it's rendering. Now, there are two types of layers. There are the default layers, the master layers. These are the ones we generally assign to Unreal. And there's the source layers, which are copies of the original data, usually as it came in from Unreal. So if we were to render out our layers on this node, it will default to the source layer instead. If I go ahead and click on Diagnostic here, it will tell me that it's writing everything out to the source layers. So this basically means we can create a backup or an initial state we can read out of our terrain before we did any procedural stamping. And this can be useful if we're going to load those layers in, for example, to grab the original terrain before we were to stamp in, say, procedural roads. And this is because we don't want to stamp in our roads based on data that already has roads in it. Right? If we were to draw roads in our terrain, and we were to move those roads somewhere else, then I don't want the road pathfinding to consider a terrain that already has that data. We want it to consider terrain that doesn't have it. So one thing we can do is we can use the source layers for that. Or alternatively, we can maybe grab the um, composite pre-procedural because we're applying the roads to the procedural layer. So we can use the pre-procedural to snap those in. So over here, back on the output, on the export node, Let's go ahead and say, I want to render out these tiles. And then we pop up our diagnostic again. Let's clear it. And we want to reset our tasks because we just did a PDG render. So we reset the PDG and then we render it out again. So now it's going to start rendering out our tiles to this folder. And it's going to take a moment. Now, depending on how many uh, threads you've set in the PDG config, it's going to be a bit faster. Uh, in general, it should take a few minutes if you set it up properly. Shouldn't take too long, depending on how many layers you have. So once it starts rendering out, here you go. It's now starting to render out different folders. And it's just going to take a moment to process through all the tiles. So let me get back to you when this is done and then we'll switch out to Unreal. OK, so now all the tiles should have been rendered out. We should have all our layers right here. If we look at, for example, the, um, let's say, the forest layer, you can see here that we have quite a few tiles available, and they have our different grayscale values. Uh, same thing for, say, the composite base. OK, so everything should be there. Let's go ahead and go to Unreal next. Let's go ahead and have a look at our landscape. So right now I'm in landscape mode. Let's go to Manage. And then under Manage, we want to go to Import. Now over here, we can now go ahead and import our different height map layers. So what we want to do is we want to select our base layer because right now we only have a height map for the base layer anyway. And you want to make sure it's unlocked as well so we can actually write into it. Then at the top, we want to import our height map. Now I've noticed that in general, you want to import a height map um, if you try to stamp in something. 
it's not always necessary, but I notice it's a bit easier to do it this way. So I'm going to grab the base layer in this case. We have these composite layers, but we don't want to put those in there because the composite layers are the accumulation of all the other layers. So we have the base layer right here. We have the macro, the micro, and the procedural layer. So the layer we want to write in this case is the base. We select that and open. And that will give us, in this case, a grid that should span our terrain. Now I have noticed that sometimes this thing is a bit wider than the actual terrain, but as long as these blue lines line up, you're fine. Now do take note that you don't want to move this. You want to keep it in its original position because otherwise the stamp is going to be in the wrong place. Next, um, if everything's set up properly and our tiles are not messed with, right? So don't start copying these, don't start adding new files in here. Um, the size should be correct too, and you should get no warnings. Keep flip Y axis off, and then we want to start implementing our materials. Now at the moment, we only have a couple of materials available. So if we just quickly look at this, we want to enable the forest layer to stamp in. So I'm gonna scroll down here, find auto forest, and apply that. We do the same thing with auto desert. And then we have the, let's see, forest floor for our little Houdini logo. And then down here we have a couple of these layers. So we want to apply the darken layer. We do have that one as well. Let's see, darken, right here, so we get all these. And then we have the remove auto snow. Okay, so if you specified those all correctly, then now we can click on import. Now do note that depending on how much memory you have available on your system, if Houdini was already taxing your system, it might be a good idea to save your scene here and then just shut Houdini down just to free up some system memory. In my case, I should be fine. I have enough memory here, but just keep in mind how much memory your system has available because a stamp does require a bit of memory to be performed. So we're going to click on import, make sure the base layer is selected and click on import. Okay, so at this point we have our terrain. Now it is probably going to compute some shaders first because this is the first time our terrain is ever generated, right? So this might take a little time, but once that's done, we now have our terrain. So um, before we do anything, I suggest you again, click save all, save your terrain. This will save out all the tiles again to the external actors folder, right? Because this is a will partition map. All these objects in the map are saved as an external file in this uh, repository. Okay, save our map. And then let's go to selection mode. So here we go. That's our terrain. And as you can see, we have our desert here, as well as in the corner over there basically based on where I drew my curves. Let's um, hide away this box and we can have a look. That's quite fun. Um, looks good to me. So yeah, great. And if we look over here, we should also have our little Houdini logo stamped into the mountainside. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, that's our terrain. That's gonna be our start. And that's how we bring our landscape into Unreal. So at the moment, that means we have a fully playable map already uh, that Houdini just generated for us. And if we also maybe display our water, then we have some nice beaches and little shorelines, right? So that's the first step. 
But next, I would like to add some roads to this terrain, because just having this terrain isn't the final stage, right? We want to then edit it. We want to have a road, maybe go from here, go through this valley, go up into this area, maybe cross some mountains to this side. You know, let's do a little bit of uh, road building. Let's get a little creative here. So to do that, we actually want to re-export our terrain again. Now I am working on an update so we can actually um, edit our terrain using the layers that were exported. But at the moment, the process is like this. We have our Unreal terrain. We export that out using the extract node. We import that into Houdini using a PNet node. We then export it back out as tiles and we can bring that back into Unreal and then we can repeat the process, right? Eventually, I want to have the ability to make the import node also load the tiles that the export node provided. Um, but for now, that's not yet an option, but that's in the, in the works. So let's go ahead to the uh, extract Unreal Landscape node again. Now, our original data was blank. Um, if you want, you can change the name of the file output here and then write it out to a new file because otherwise it will erase the old one. Do as you want. In my case, I'm going to erase over it. I'm going to basically go to my folder here and I'm going to overwrite this file. So let's go ahead and save this out again. To do this, click on recommit assuming your Houdini engine is running, or alternatively, you can rebuild the tool. Uh, but recommit should basically grab the landscape again. Uh, again, this is going to lock up Unreal for just a moment. So I'll get back to you when it's done importing this. Okay, so it's almost done. And here we go. Let's see, should be getting control back. Yeah, here we go. So now what we can do is we can, again, click export to so do that. And it's going to finish exporting it and it's going to write it to this file in this case again. If you want to write it to another one, you just have to rename it right here. OK, so now we have our terrain captured in this file. Let's go ahead and go back to Houdini. And now if we were to load in our terrain somewhere, Let's go to this PNET node. Now I'm going to go to the top here and switch out my landscape file. Um, in your case, you probably don't have this file. So you want to go to this folder. And then grab our new export. Grab the one with the large uh, file size because that one contains all the layers of our terrain. All right, so if we grab this one. OK, so once it's imported that data, we should now be able to see it. Let's go ahead over here. And if we click on the landscape data, we get our information right here. We should have all these settings configured. Again, make sure that when you import your landscape information, you have this configured as well. So all your non-weight blended layers need to be set properly. You shouldn't have to do this all the time. If it's set once properly, you don't change your layers too much or at all. Uh, this should always stay configured. So that should be OK. Or you can just tag this off and then it won't update these settings. Uh, you do have to make sure this is set properly, though. Next, again, make sure this file is specified properly. And then we can go down. And now if we click on our preview, we should be able to see all the information that was just brought out of Unreal. So again, we have our different material layers. We have our height layers. Once again, there's nothing in the macro layer right now. Um, and we have our composite layers down here. Now, at the moment, this is being imported. So what I would like to do is create a snapshot of whatever this was and save it out to my tile folder as well. So I want to externalize all this data. We have our new map folder right there. And then inside of that, we have our source folder. But at the moment, we only have our pre-composite layer. So this was the state of the terrain before we 
built our initial landscape. I would like to override this, right? And I also want to store all the other layers like the materials in here as well, so I can sample them. So let's go ahead and go to our layers to render. I'm gonna turn everything on in this case, make sure our PDG is configured. So it's gonna be nice and fast. And then let's write out a diagnostic again. Oh, and make sure the folder is correct, right? You'll actually see that. That's why I usually write out a diagnostic first, just to give me a readout to make sure I don't write into the wrong folder. Let's go ahead and render that out as a pre-diagnostic. And it should tell me where it's gonna put it. Okay, so tiles, workshop, new map. And it's gonna render out all these tiles as source layers. Okay, so with this configured properly, now we can go ahead and render this out. I always recommend you double check, right? If it's already configured in your scene, you just have to click render, but before you do that, make sure you check. Let's go ahead and render this out again, and then I'll see you when it's done. Okay, so our tile render is complete. If we now look in our source folder, we should have all our layers written out. So like I said, our source folder is inside the master folder, which is inside our project folder for our tiles. So tiles, project, master folder, source folder. And the source folder is the snapshot of the terrain that came from Unreal. The master folder is what we tend to write out when we've applied our changes. Okay, so the source folder allows us to sample what was before. The master folder contains what is after. And now we have this written out, we can actually use it. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go up top here. Now, um, I would like to build some roads for our terrain. Now I'm gonna, not gonna spend too much time on it, but let me quickly go over how the Pathfinder works. So over here, I have a curve, okay? It's a simple curve that I've drawn out. And actually, I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm gonna drop in a new one. Let's reset it. And next, let's go ahead and use that curve to load some data. Now, the next node in our setup here is the load layers node. And the load layers node allows us to load layer information stored in the tile cache, and then apply that to our input geometry or we can use it to create some height fields from them. Um, now in our case, what I want to do first is set up our master folder because it's currently not set properly. Let's go to the top and then we want to browse to our current project. Now that would be over here. I'm just gonna select that. Our current hip file location basically. Um, I'm gonna go to tiles and then select our current project and this is the master folder, so we just want to accept that. So now we have this file path, tiles, and then our project name. And this will allow us to load in that data. Next, we want to specify how we want to load in this data. So let me just disable some of these options and switch it to live. So the way how this works is that if we specify some kind of information like this curve, and we render this perhaps, then right now we're not seeing anything because we don't have any input information. But if I were to draw a section of curve here, let's say around here. And now this node is gonna start looking for tiles that are in that same location. So let me explain this a little bit. And here you can see the grid of our terrain. These are marked as green tiles. And if we look at the second output of the node, so the blue output, we can also view the height map that's currently being loaded. So these are basically all the tiles that we're currently loading. Now the tiles we are loading come from over here. And let me clean this up quickly and I'll show you what it does. So currently we are loading from the master folder a material as height and let's specify the um, pre-procedural 
composite. So the pre-procedural composite is, like I mentioned, the composite of the base layer and the pre-procedural layer. So in our case, that would be the base layer and the macro layer, the first two layers in our landscape, right? So this is the composite of that. Now there's no data yet in the macro layer, so it's basically just the base layer right now. Um, we can import that as height, and then we can write it out to either a couple of height fields, or we can write it to our input curve. So if I were to resample this curve, you'll actually see that it should be grabbing some height information. Give it a sec. There we go. So as you can see, it's actually grabbed the height of our terrain and it's remapping it to that curve. But we can also write attributes to that curve as well. So let's grab, for example, the darken information, right? Because the darken layer has a lot of noise in it, a lot of detail. So we can write that out. Now I want to write it out as a, an attribute, not as height. In general, you just want to write one thing to height, not multiple. And then we can specify what we want to write it out as. So we can say mask. So now we have a mask attribute inside this curve. And also it also tends to write out the slope information of the terrain at the same time. Uh, but what we care about here is the mask. So I can then visualize that with say a color node. Right. So as you can see, we have some values in there. Um, so this can be useful if you want to sample for your data, a particular layer, and it will only load the layers that are actually necessary to be loaded. Now we can specify we want to load a bigger radius. So if we set this to 2000, it will load more tiles around our geometry. So it is possible to do that. In this case, we are loading everything around our spline here. Um, just keep in mind that doing that will require a bit more memory to load. Just keep it in mind. Now it's also possible to just load the entire terrain by using our tile IDs here. Uh, in this case, I'm not just going to do that just yet. What I am going to do, however, is feed this into this weighted grid node. Now the weighted grid node creates a grid for our pathfinder to use. And we basically see this as a representation of red and blue lines. Blue lines are cheap, red lines are expensive. And this is a weighted result. And the Pathfinder will use that to avoid slopes and then try to stick to more shallow paths across our terrain. Then over here, we can also set up a couple of other values. I recommend you leave these alone for the default settings, but you can play with it if you want. Um, now, one thing we can do is maybe change our sea level. So depending on where our water is in our world, we can maybe prevent our grid from going, uh, you know, below the water or too close to it. So if our water is at, say, 11,000, then we probably want to make sure that our grid doesn't go too high. So maybe we set this to uh, 125. And this will give us a bit more grid space around the shorelines, right? This will keep the roads away from the shore, but it won't allow them to go into the water. All right, so once we're happy with that, we can also save out this grid to a cache. Uh, we can use that to load it into our uh, Pathfinder over here, into our cache-based Pathfinder, or just save it out to load it later. So we can go in here and then specify our current path for the cache, our project name, which in this case is called new map and then path grid and then we save that out so this allows us to quickly save out a cache of this grid and we can use that later so you kind of see where I'm going with this the entire tool set is based around caches and then we can just grab it with other tools so right now we have this grid right here and we could use that for a pathfinder later on Let's go back um, and let's go over here. So we have our curve 
and we can then configure that curve using this asset, the configure paths. Now you can specify your individual groups, how you want it to be configured. I'm just going to clear this right now. And we want to maybe set a particular path to say be a ground type, um, set the priority based on how they should composite later on if they ever cross one another. We can set the width of the path. This is all basically just pr um, primitive attributes that we can feed through the pathfinder and then feed to other systems below. So let's uh, say we use this. Now the main settings here that are important are the magnetized value and the turning rigidity. If we have multiple paths, magnetize means that newer paths will snap to existing paths. They will magnetize to it. On the other hand, rigidity um, prevents the path from making too many turns. If the turning rigidity is really high, then it will make the pathfinder go straighter and probably prefer steeper slopes. If it's really low, 0 0.5, then it will make more turns. Okay, so let's use this and then we can feed that to our pathfinder. So we have our grid here and then we have our pathfinder over here. If we go ahead and run the pathfinder using this grid and this curve, then now it's going to create a little path for us. If we go ahead and combine these with the terrain and we visualize that, now you can see it's following the terrain and it's trying to path over it and it's going to zigzag up these slopes to get from point A to B as best as it can. So this is a very simple setup. You can use that as a pathfinding system. Um, alternatively, let's say we change our setups here. We go to a turning rigidity of 0 0.5. Then it should turn these roads into something a bit more uh, snaky. If we set it much higher, then it will create much straighter paths. All right. Now, like I said, the Pathfinder is recursive, meaning that it can add existing roads uh, onto one another. You can feed other roads that were previously generated with the Pathfinder into this input, or we can maybe path two paths in sequence. So let's go ahead and add another curve in here. Now, I have noticed that the curve 2.0 is a little sluggish because it tends to update the viewport whenever you move your mouse over it. It causes the node chain to cook. So if you don't want to do that, you can also alternatively use the curve 1.0. If you use that one, you can enable that one using the um, asset options here. And then asset definition toolbar, show always, and then switch it to the standard curve node. If we plug that one in, and maybe we just draw a couple of segments here. Now, note how it's a bit sluggish to update this, and that's simply because um, our tool is currently updating everything live. What we could potentially do is lock down our grid. So if we go over here to the load layers node, we can tell it to stash our grid. If we enable this, then at this point, our grid will be stashed. It will stash out the tiles that it needs to load. And as long as we don't press this button here or change any of these settings, our grid will remain and even if we update this curve at least our layers won't be reloaded so we can use this if we want to have an interactive interface but we don't want to have it uh, constantly recompute so now let's just finish this up let's go ahead and um, maybe add one more path so we can press shift and then click again and I'll make it do a little back and forth. And as a result, the Pathfinder is very likely to just follow back over itself and then branch off somewhere to uh, continue from there, which creates very nice snaking roads like this. Now we're still using a very high turning rigidity, so the system is not gonna create a lot of zigzags. 
again, we can switch this to a lower level and then it will create more zigzags, a more curvy road. All right, so if we like that, then let's go ahead and preview that here. There we go. So now we have a little road network that snakes across our map. Now, of course, using the Pathfinder in this way is going to be a bit sluggish because every time we make an update, as you might have noticed, the system takes a while. It takes a while to think. That's not the most optimal way to do this. So let's go ahead and um, instead use our editor over here so we can actually feed this to our terraforming system and apply the new roads to our world. So next, what I would like to do is go up here. I have this set up here for the load layers. Let's just go ahead and um, set this one up. So give me a second. We go to our workshop, tile folder, our current project, and then we select the master folder. Now notice how this particular load layers node has been configured to load tile IDs. If we look at this one, notice how it's currently loading everything because I've basically told it to load everything from zero to 1000. So all tiles from zero to 1000 are being loaded. Uh, they're also stashed, so it's not gonna change this at all, but we can always lower this and notice what happens. Maybe we set it even lower like that. Notice how it's telling us that these are inactive stashes, meaning that they're currently still being loaded because they're stashed, but we're not actually asking for them over here. So if we stash this, then it's going to update this and unload all of these tiles. As a result, we don't grab that data, right? We do want that, so let's keep it back on 1000. and this should load everything. Now notice how we're currently loading the master source folder. This basically means that we are loading our tile information from the source folder. So this represents the terrain as it was in Unreal when we imported it with our import node, right? We can also load the master folder and then just make sure we um, we load the pre-procedural one, but I'm going to stick to pre-composite, pre-procedural. So pre-composite, pre-procedural is basically the state of the terrain before any compositing took place. It's what generally is saved into the source folder. And this is the pre-procedural layer. So this is before we applied any procedural data. It's all about layering here. So in general, you want to pick the right layer to get your data from. So you make sure that you don't accumulate your data in the wrong way. All right, so with that, we can then go ahead and feed this to our grid. We're loading the whole map right now. And if we load the grid, just give it a second to compute. Then let's make sure our height for the grid is set correctly. So once again, I'm gonna use um, 125 keep all the settings the same and just for simplicity i'm going to also export out this again as a file so let's make sure we save it out to the correct folder i believe we named this one new map yes new map let's go ahead and save that one As you can see, it's just been updated and we now have a well, pretty sizable file. The grids are quite expensive, uh, depending on how many connections you have. Of course, it's going to be even more expensive if you if you increase the amount of connections available. Um, that's just how they work, right? So by limiting your grid size, you can reduce the amount of time it takes for the Pathfinder to compute, but you also have less space to work with. All right, so next let's go and look at the path editor. So this one is the second most complex node in the system. It's definitely the most interactive one. This tool allows us to draw paths into our world. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is make sure we set up the tool. We want to make sure we write to the right folder 
to the right project. So I'm going to write this one to new map. And then leave everything else the same. Um, it is going to write out console warnings, which means that whenever we save something, it's going to pop up the console for us. Like in this case, it's already telling us it's reloading the cache. If you don't want those warnings, you can disable this. We have a certain amount of undos available and we have a curve node that we need. So in this case, I have a curve node plugged in, so I'm not going to have to click this button again. This one will create one for you. Then next to that, uh, let's go to the node. So right now we are loading our grid into the node using this input. And as a result, we have a representation of our terrain because this terrain is actually being loaded. Uh, it's being generated based on the grid. That's why these holes exist because there's no grid there, right? That's where our lakes are. Now, um, if we want to, we can also use our stash file as well. So at the moment, we are loading our grid from the asset input. We can also regenerate our grid internally using this option if we only have tile information available. So we basically have this set up here inside the node as well. Or we can load our cache file from here. So let's do that. If you've exported it out correctly, nothing should change because this is now basically just loading it from this file. So I can actually just go ahead and disconnect these and the note will work just fine. Okay. So at this point, our grid's not going to change. Of course, if you are going to update your terrain significantly, you update the uh, base layer and maybe the macro, um, the macro layer, like the pre procedural layer, uh, you do want to update your grid because otherwise your pathfinder won't know, you know, what's there and you'll have a bad result. All right. So let's go to the editor. And I'm just going to pull up my curve here. Actually, let me lock this and then I can grab my curve. Now note again, uh, I need to actually see my curve. So I'm going to grab a parameter panel here. Just do that. So I can erase it if I need to. And that should be good. So next, let's draw a couple of roads. Let's go to add mode on the tool. And notice how here at the top, it tells us the cache file will be created on export. It means right now we don't have any road cache file to work with yet. What we can do is we can maybe just draw a segment in here, like uh, turn on snapping, click, and maybe I turn this into mouse up mode. Just go across our terrain, just a short enough segment, nothing too big. This is gonna make the Pathfinder run. Now, if you have trouble seeing this, you can increase your visualization settings. Um, make this section a bit bigger. Or in this case, we're viewing it as a solid mesh. You can view it as a spline as well, as a, a shape like this. The mesh is useful if you operate this tool in Unreal. Without it, you can uh, basically you can turn this on or off if you want. Change your representation. Now notice this big circle here. That's the radius in which the Pathfinder can path. If you followed my previous pathfinding um, workshop from a few years ago, you might remember this. Basically the Pathfinder can path from this point to that point and then a little bit of extra space around it. That's set based on these settings over here. So if we want to configure our Pathfinder, we can do that over here where right now our grid is being cut in such a way that the Pathfinder can only path within this circle. If we increase this to say 0.5, the radius will increase. And then the Pathfinder can go a bit further around to find a way to its endpoint. Of course, doing that does make the Pathfinder a bit slower, or at least potentially. Next, we can determine what type of path we want to build. So I have a couple of presets for names here. Let's say we build a medium road. At the moment, there's no real preset auto setting here. Um, we have to feed this in ourselves. So I'm going to say a medium road has a priority of five and uh, a path width of eight. 
Next to that, I want my medium road to have a sand texture. This is based on the materials that I want to assign later on. Because all this really does is assign um, pr um, primitive attributes to the curves that this tool outputs. Let's go ahead and build this road in. So we can do arm export. And then we do add to cache. And what this will do is we'll basically just take this curve that the Pathfinder has created and it will output it to our cache file. Notice how this system here now says cache data found. So now we actually have some data. If we go back to our folder, you see that now we have also a paths BGO file right there. So that's our cache file for these paths. So if we want to, we can then continue pathfinding these roads out, right? Maybe we expand our road network just a bit. I'm going to go from this point to that point, let it find its way. Okay, let's say we like that and then add that to the cache. So we can gradually build out our path network on our terrain. Now the Pathfinder is a little bit um, stubborn. I mean, it's a Pathfinder. It just tries to find the cheapest path between point A and point B. If you notice that it does something like this, you can remove it. Um, for example, we can go to remove mode. We can then specify how we want to remove it. We can remove it by number, for example. So we can specify this guy here as number one. Turns red. And then we can delete that from the cache. Also notice how the curve has now recomposited, meaning that between one intersection and another, or an intersection and an endpoint, a dead end, it always has to have one continuous curve. You cannot have two types of roads that switch from one into the other without an intersection or a dead end. Okay, so let's say we want to update this road to a different type. Because right now, if we view this, let me um, increase the size of my icons here so we have a bit easier time to see that. We have a medium road um, and it has a material of sand. Let's make this a highway with a dirt material. I don't have asphalt here, so bear with me. Um, what I would like to do is select this particular road so I can go back to my number selection, reference its number, which is zero. That will select it and then we can specify what we want to do with it. Again, the interactivity on this is still a work in progress, but the idea is that you can now specify a different type of road. So let's make this into a main road. Let's give it a higher priority. Change its path width to maybe 12, and I'm gonna change this one to dirt. So now, if we look at it, it will tell this road is um, main road, 12 width, dirt material, and priority 10. So that will allow us to update this particular path segment. Let's go ahead and save that. Okay, so at this point, we can basically go ahead and pathfind across our terrain. If you want, you can spend some time on this. Um, so let's say I quickly just draw a highway going from here to our desert right there. So I'm going to grab this endpoint and I'm going to put it over there go into add mode that will enable the pathfinder and then it's just going to do its thing so the longer your paths the bigger the grid it's going to consider and that means the slower it is so do consider that but the benefit is we only have to path one segment at a time right we can path multiple segments at a time if we want we can add more points more waypoints and then the pathfinder will just continue going on just like we did before with our manual approach of course, it will slow down the process a bit, so keep that in mind. Um, but once it's completed, it should be done here shortly. So here we go. We now have an additional section of road. Let's confirm this is what we want. Yeah, that should do. And uh, let's go ahead and stamp this in. So we add that to the cache. Um, now, the way how the Pathfinder works is it's going to try to follow its own path depending on your magnetization setting, it might try to find more routes that might make it slower or faster. If you want, you can always just cancel out the cook at this stage and then um, wipe your curve, right? So we have this curve here. 
and wipe it, that will at least mean it doesn't try to recompute that path. There are some user features I'm still improving. Um, now we have a path now defined. Let's add a little dirt road that just spans maybe this section of the map and then let's stamp this into our world because I don't want to spend too much time on this. We're already running quite late. So let's say we expand upon this road here. I'm gonna click near this road and depending on our snapping setting here, it's going to snap to that endpoint or to any of these points within the curve. So let's go ahead and add another segment in here. Now, since the Pathfinder is probably gonna try and connect to one of these curves here, let's quickly create a little segment over here somewhere to constrain it and make sure that it actually follows from this point out. Then maybe I want to make it go over this hill. And as you increase the amount of paths, it is gonna cost just a bit more to compute, right? Um, and then we can make it go down the valley maybe up to here. So the more segments you draw, the smaller the radius is the Pathfinder can look and the more accurate your path will be. Also, the bigger segment you draw, the more grid it has to consider and the slower it becomes. So drawing smaller segments is not a bad thing. Um, you can use it to constrain your, your paths. Let's say I want this road, but I just wanna double check what type it is. Now notice how currently it says main road with 12 and uh, type dirt. That doesn't match our settings here. And that's because when I drew this path, I expanded it upon this existing road here. Basically right now, the roads are compositing with one another and it's currently resolving by novelty by keeping the existing type. Like I mentioned, roads can only contain one type from an intersection to an endpoint or between intersections. So as a result, this road has basically recomposited itself to use the old road type that was present here. Let me change my visualizer for a second. You can see that right now the width of this road is basically the same. Now if I go and I change my um, resolve option here and I change it to new, then now this road is gonna follow the smaller road width because it's gonna change this section here to match these settings over here. It's gonna make it only four meters wide, which is what I want. Let's go ahead and apply this road. Again, right now it's gonna recom uh, recompute a part of the section. That's fine. We can then erase our curve and let's just finish it up by drawing another section to go from here to there. So I'm gonna click over here. And then maybe go across these mountains. Of course, nothing prevents you from actually writing out your roads as they are to the cache. So you can always just click on add to cache and then you know build segment after segment. Just keep in mind that if you write really small sections, you might be forcing the Pathfinder to take a path that it might not have picked if you just gave it free reign. So let's go ahead and make it path up to that road there, finish the circuit, and then we should be good to go. All right. That looks good. I think that looks good. So let's just go ahead and use that. Notice that if it's hard to see, don't doubt to, you know, switch to another view type. It will allow you to work with the tool easier. Let's say we like this result. Um, let's see what it's doing here. It appears to be overriding a section of our road. Right, so as a result of us changing our setting, because we are overlapping a section of this existing road, we are also updating this part here. We might not want to do that. We do want to update this section, but we don't want to update this existing road here. So just set it back to keep existing. That's the default setting as well. As a result, now this road should be 
still a dirt road. Sorry, a sand road. Because it was updated previously. But this segment should now remain a dirt road. If it's blue, it means it's updated something. Um, just keep that in mind. If we're happy with that, we can add it to the cache and then we save it out. Now, let me quickly cover one last feature of the cache path editor, and that's the ability to draw custom spline paths. Now, I'm not going to add these to the network here right now, but I just want to show you. We have the ability to use our curve system here to draw a very custom path. Let's say we want to add a bridge from this point to that point. Okay, we can do that by say placing our point here. And then let's just place a couple of waypoints. And as you can see, we are now drawing a custom curve that spans our gap. Now this is a NURBS curve at the moment because inside the tool I have configured it to resample the input. Without that, it's just going to draw straight segments. Also, we can bind the spline to the ground as well. And if you need to, um, you can also use this snap mode here later to update the spline, either make it fly across or make it ground snapped. Now, we also have an option here called archetype. An archetype allows us to set what this curve should be. So later tools in the network could use that for say drawing a tunnel or drawing a bridge or make it automatically decide what it should do. Now this feature does work for stamping in roads, but I don't actually have any bridges or tunnels yet. So at the moment, I'm just gonna leave this alone for now. But just keep in mind that when you add these in, they are added as a separate data set. So if I go and add this to the cache, then the pathfinding roads are not actually going to use this path, except that they will avoid these purple areas to some extent to make sure they don't interfere with it either. So that's something you can add. Um, this way we can add tunnels, we can add bridges, we can add very custom roads over our terrain using a simple curve node like this. Now I'm going to remove this one for now and I'm going to continue uh, so we output this to the actual map. So I'm going to go to remove. Let's select this spline. We are in the data set for spline paths so we can only select those and I'm going to delete this one. One thing to note is that when you add a spline path it is also added to the grid so if you have a spline path in place, then the waypoint pathfinder can actually use it to path across the map. Just another thing that you can use. Now, we don't have enough time to go into depth on all the features of the tool. I mean, we also have different view states. Um, we can use our spline paths in different ways. We can select our curves in different ways. But ultimately, I don't want to make this video too long. So let's continue on and let's actually bring this road network here into Unreal next. So let's go with this. We have a nice little road network going on that we can follow across our world. Um, let's stamp that into our terrain. So next I have this setup here, which is actually part of a note that I'm writing. I've exposed it here. You can just play around with it if you want. Basically all this does is it cleans up our road curves. I'm using some of my merged blinds nodes. These are the labs nodes that were released last year with Houdini 19.5 they help us clean up our road curves if i just show this specifically the road width is cleaned up with this node and all our curves are properly segmented as well we go down the list and then here we have something that blends the intersections helps us create proper smooth intersections over here you'll notice how they level out a bit with one another. And then over here we have the ability to export out our splines. Now I'm going to be using this to save out a spline for the barrier tool that we're going to be running at the end of the workshop here. Um, we're almost done. 
just going to stamp this out and then we're going to load that into Unreal. So I would like to save this out to my cache. Now I do want to write it out to the correct one. So let's go up to the top level, go to new map. And then uh, we want to write this out as a cache we can remember. So let's do cache road spline dot bgo like that and we save this this is still manual but basically this means that um, i have another cache here for my road spline we can use that for barriers to analyze the curvature to know where the roads are etc we go down the network and then we're going to turn this into a ribbon so we take the road width, we give it a ribbon, which has a bit of width, right? And we need this detail to stamp in the weighted transfer of the, this node, the weighted height transfer. Basically, the weighted height transfer has two modes. Like I mentioned before, it has a simple mode and an advanced mode. And the advanced mode allows us to use a couple of different settings, like a noise option. So over here, I have some fall off noises. I can display those. Notice how we have a little bit of a grayscale on top of our curves, like here. And these are noises for the fall off and the fall off blend. Uh, next to that, we can also set how wide our road should be based on their fall off. So I can split here, for example, uh, different types of roads, trails or whatnot, set the different fall off range for these roads. That will basically mean that the roads will blend using a noise into the terrain. It will create a nice transition. It's easier to show than to say. So let's go ahead and take our terrain here that we have. And I'm going to make sure that before I do anything, I set the procedural layer right here, because that's the one we want to write into. And I'm going to purge that layer. Now, there's currently nothing in that layer to purge, but this is for the procedural stamping. We want to constantly be replacing this, right? If we move our roads, if we change our roads, we don't want to double up on them. We don't want to start stamping a road on top of an existing road. We want to wipe that result and then write a new one in. So in general, that's going to be the workflow for your procedural systems. You're basically recreating your data, compositing it together, and then stamping it in all together into the procedural layer. Okay, so let's go ahead and use our um, weighted height transfer here. It's always a good idea, by the way, to keep an eye on your memory levels. Like I said, if you don't have enough memory or you make too big a map, uh, maybe shut down Unreal in the process or switch between Houdini and Unreal. Just a tip. All right, so here we have the weighted height transfer and it's done its thing. And it's basically taken our road uh, ribbon we generated over here and it's stamped it into the terrain. Now notice how we have this uh, slight fall off on the edges. This is a weighted fall off, meaning that it does a pretty good job of transitioning and keeping a nice smooth road deck just to make sure that we don't get some artifacts. Uh, if I were to transition this with, say, a standard simple falloff transfer, we would get some weird noise going on in this area where the roads intersect. And that's simply because it wouldn't know which road to prefer when they overlap, especially, and then it will look pretty bad. So I'll quickly show this. Not the worst in this case, but yeah, here you can see it. This is a good example. Notice how it doesn't know which road to pick, and this just becomes a sheer cliff. There is a fall off going on out here when there's no conflict between our different roads. But when these roads are conflicting with one another, like there, there, and there, we just get a really bad, harsh transition because there's no blending between them. That's what the weighted fall off transfer is about. If we enable that, they start to blend together and it becomes a lot more nice looking, a lot more smooth. Okay. Um, you do want to control your falloffs, which is what this mask is about. This is the representation of the falloff written out as a mask. And then we can control what type of falloff we want to use depending on the situation. Not, I'm not going to go into all the settings here because it will take a bit of time. I'm currently using the most advanced setup here as well. 
But basically we have three types of falloffs right now with two variations for each. Uh, so we have the standard falloff around say level areas of the terrain, maybe around here. Then we have a falloff for cliffs that are downwards and we have a falloff for upward cliffs. And this creates a bit of noise, a little bit of randomization and it just generally looks nicer. Okay. All right, so with that, we now have this stamped. And if we were to apply this to our export, it will be stamped into our terrain. Next, let's go ahead and grab our material um, attribute on our road curves. And that's been transitioned into our geometry here. So you just grab this. In this case, this is the sand material. And this is the dirt material, right? two different materials. I've split them out into two different stamps. I use my little setup here for transitioning it back to the height field as a mask. And then we can stamp it using a blended material transfer into the roads. So the first one I'm transferring here is the sand. So over here I have the sand layer. I'm stamping that first. Okay, there we go. So now we have our road visible over here. Um, but I would also like to make sure that if the sand goes through, say, the snowy mountain areas, I want to fade it out and I want to replace it a bit with some snow. So I can then take my stamp here, create a new mask for it. Let's say we go over here to this snowy area in the mountains. We have this very faded section, this very faded stamp, and we're going to apply that to overlay on top of our sandy roads. So this one is set to stamp max, right? We're stamping at 0.99 precision, so we don't erase the layers below completely. Uh, and then we're gonna stamp that in. And that's gonna apply just a little bit of snow on top of our sand in the areas where there are snowy mountains. You can art direct this basically. Then let's go ahead and um, maybe add a bit of dirt to our dirt roads. Now, in this case, I'm gonna stamp a different material. I'm not gonna stamp a weighted material. I'm gonna stamp a non-weighted material. That's basically the non-weighted procedural dirt road. Now, inside my landscape material that I created, I added a layer that will sit on top of all the other layers. That is the procedural dirt road. This one is independent from all the other weighted layers. And as a result, if we stamp this in, we can then erase it or place more of it, but it will keep all the other layers below it intact. It's not gonna change their weighting at all. As long as we set that up properly within the import node, if you remember over here, it will not change the weighting of these guys and just stamp on top of everything, like a, a layer on top of everything. Just as an example to show you that we can do this type of stamping in different ways. So I'm gonna stamp that one in. I'm gonna stamp it in as a procedural dirt road. Again, you can just use the drop down to pick up whatever material you wanna stamp and then set the type. And then we're just gonna do a couple of other options here like um, remove all the grass. So this one is specifically for the grass spawning. I want to remove all the grass that might be near my roads just in case there is just a little bit of um, material layer underneath there for the standard uh, layer that will spawn grass. I want to remove that. This layer here is another non-blended layer that will remove the foliage spawning underneath the roads. And then the last one here is I want to remove some of that darkening we did just around the roads as well. Now, because material layers don't use edit layers, this is destructive. So previously when we created this, right? When we created the darkened mask, and this creates some nice effects into the terrain, specifically in the deserts, actually, we can actually see that around here, around the hills. Now, let me hide this thing again so we don't have that shadow. You can see that we have this tiny amount of darkening in these grooves, and there's also some nice patches of darkening around the mountains. Um, that's from my previous stamp when we created our terrain. In this case, I'm gonna override that. 
and I'm not going to be able to get it back. Now I am working on a workflow to be able to undo any procedural stamping and then reapply it, um, but that's not complete yet. So at the moment, if we do this, we are going to erase that part of the darkened material. And you do have to keep that in mind. It might be a good idea to keep a backup of this layer around so you can always restore it if you need to. Just my two cents. All right, so with that, um, let's go ahead and write this out, bring it into Unreal, and then let's wrap up this workshop because we're almost done. I know this is quite a long one, but I hope you find it interesting. So let's go back over here and I'm just going to close these, get them out of my way. Um, and we can actually preview again our layers. So again, if I can maybe have a look at the auto force layer. Notice how now it's actually stamped into that layer or rather removed from it, our road. But it has not removed that um, procedural road because that one wasn't changing the weight blending at all. Likewise, our desert also has it removed over here. And if we look at our snow layer, for example, we'll probably see a little bit of it here where we have our sand road in the in the mountain um, and everything else. I mean, all the other layers like the darken layer. So we can preview our results. Always make sure you check your stuff. And then once we're happy, let's go ahead and uh, write this out. So I'm going to set up my PDG again. Make sure that's all set up. Make sure we write to the right project folder. Make sure you write to the right project folder. Might be a good idea to just create a link from there to here. Make sure we uh, don't accidentally write to the wrong project. Like so. And then check it out. So it's going to tell us we are going to write to the right folder. We're going to write all these layers. At the moment, we're going to write every layer, including the base layer. If you don't want that, you can also say, I only want to write all the affected edit layers. If you do that instead, let's reset, re-render. Then now it's only going to write out the procedural and the micro layer. This is in case you don't want to update that base layer that we have. Um, might be a good safety, right? We're not changing anything about the base layer right now, but we also don't need to update it either. So let's just keep that in mind. We want to write out new composites as well. So this will grab all of our composites, update those, and then we render. So at this point, we're just gonna let it do its thing, and then I'll see you back in Unreal when this is done. Okay, it's done outputting. So let's go ahead and bring this into Unreal. So once more. Let's zoom out there a bit. I'm going to go into landscape mode. And we want to import all of our edit layers once again. So I'm just going to take a second. Go to import. And the first thing I want to import is my procedural changes. Now we can do that by locking our base layer. Make sure we don't select that one by accident then unlock our procedural layer, go to our height map import, and then we want to specify our procedural layer. So the layer that we named procedural layer in here. Let's specify that one, double check and import. But this should not take too long, assuming it doesn't auto save in the meantime. So now if we zoom in a bit, we should be seeing some procedural terraforming on our terrain, but we don't have any materials yet. So let's do that one next. I'm going to switch over my layer to the base layer. Once again, unlock that, change out my height map. Now, you don't need to 
import the base layer again. But I've noticed that sometimes it doesn't know what size the terrain actually is without the height map. So normally I just take my base layer and re-import that. Um, this might not be required. Perhaps you can just import it and then disable it again once it knows what the height of your or the size of your terrain is rather. All right, so we want to update a couple of layers here. Let's just go through the list, grab all the layers, make sure you grab the right ones. So auto forest goes into auto forest. We've updated the desert. So we're going to go there, select that, update. Um, we don't have any cliffs, grass. Uh, we do have our forest floor. I have not messed with that one, so we don't have to re-import it. But if something else were to go straight through the forest floor, where our Houdini logo is, right? Um, we would have to update it, but just in case, let's grab that one. We have our sand over here because we have sand roads now. Let's make sure we import the sand road. We do it from snow, right? So let's grab those as well. Right there. And then we have some updates to the remove grass. So all of this, uh, the darken layer as well. Then let's grab the procedural dirt road, which is the, again, procedural non-weighted material for dirt roads. And then we have the remove auto snow, which I don't think I messed with too much, but let's also update this one. Do keep in mind that loading more layers does mean it will take more memory. Again, if you're running out of memory, you can shut down Houdini, right? Let's go and import that. Again, it's a good idea to actually check, double check you write it to the right layer. Now, that's why I lock my layers before I do anything, just to make sure that, uh, you know, I don't accidentally write it into the wrong one. Always double check. That's my advice. So now here we go. It seems to have stamped everything. If you get any weird artifacts or weird pieces of the terrain floating, um, that's just a graphics glitch usually, unless the stamping ran out of memory, in which case you'll have to restamp it, because this does take a bit of memory. And if we go up to full, it will start writing into your SSD or your hard drive, and that can cause some issues. So, all right, we're done. Let's go ahead and save. Right, go to selection mode, and here we go. So now we have some roads in our terrain. Go check it out. Now you might notice that the grass doesn't always update right away. You can kind of force the shaders to re-update um, just by going to the content folder, go to the materials, and then select the material you used for your landscape. If you double click that, it will force it to compute and that should update the grass. Otherwise, go to build um, and rebuild your landscape. That can also help. So let me just do that. I'll get back to you when it's done. Okay, so it seems just re just opening up the landscape material here uh, actually fixed it. That's because the grass is updated from the material, and if the material isn't loaded properly or updated properly, then the grass won't update. So anyway, um, here we go. So we have our roads, and that means we're almost done, right? Now, the benefit of this pipeline is that we can actually do manual edits in the terrain. We can sculpt our, say, um, micro layer or uh, post procedural layer. Um, we can sculpt any of the layers if we want to. Just keep in mind that if you're going to stamp stuff into the procedural layer, then don't apply your manual changes to the procedural layer because you're going to be constantly wiping that out anyway. All right? That's the main reason we have a separate layer for the procedural, just to make sure that we have a separate layer that doesn't interfere with other manual work. Yeah, overall, this is looking quite nice. So here we go into our desert area. And I mean, a lot of this uh, texture work is just the auto material. We do have some of our 
you know, custom stuff as well. Um, the roads, of course. But I find that having a good auto material actually makes quite a lot of difference. There's a little bit of snow on these roads, but I guess the road just didn't go quite high enough to to really layer well. Anyway. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, right, so we're almost done. So at this point, let's just add in the last little bit. This is pretty pretty simple. Remember how we output our cache before for our road splines? Well, we can actually grab that with our um, road barrier tool and instantiate a couple of meshes along the roads. So let's do that. Let's go to our HGA folder. It's gonna go up here. Let's go ahead and grab our barrier instancer here. And this one is old, so I'm gonna delete it. Go down to our HDA folder again. Reinstantiate this one at the origin. It's kind of important that this tool is at the center of the world um, because it spans the entire world in this case. And then over here in its settings, we need to change a couple things. So the first thing we want to do is specify the um, location of the road spline. So we're going to browse for that. Let's go to our project here, go to our cache, new map, road spline. And then we want to specify the um, tile folder. Now in this case, this tile folder is the old one. We want to specify the new one because this is going to build these roads as if they were part of the other example map. So I'm going to go over again and grab my file path. So we have our current project folder. Let's browse for the landscape tile master folder. Select our current project and select that. And assuming this updates properly, we should now have some barriers being spawned along our roads. So let's give it a second update and we'll see. Okay, it seems to have updated correctly. Um, in general, I find using the dots is the most secure way of getting this to update properly. And then we just need to find somewhere where it would spawn barriers. So in general, that should be around a cliff in a corner, right, like here. Now, at the moment, I don't have any meshes loaded properly, so we can go down here to the bottom. Um, I have some meshes in the Megascans folder. Go to 3D Assets. We have these um, barriers here. The first one. Let's drag that into the top barrier A asset. And that should instantiate those. And we can maybe tweak these values a bit, make them a bit shorter. Now, like I said, this asset is originally made for a different asset, so might not be quite right but we are instantiating some of these barriers now we can also scale them up if we want to maybe make them 50 percent bigger make this a bit larger so we can see as you can see now they are next to the road and on top of the ground because it's loading the height map it's loading the tiles and it's loading that road curve that's right here and offsetting these barriers accordingly it's going to scan the height map find out where there's a cliff, and then it's gonna place these barriers. And it's pretty much automatic. Let's uh, also drop in the other asset here, over there. I know this one is quite small, so let's say two meters. And then let's find some of those. Should be around here somewhere. There we go. Maybe 1.5, 1.4. Something like that, okay. All right, so at this point, um, we're pretty much done. I mean, we can just go ahead and save everything. Save that. And play. That's a fully procedural world. And we can always go back to Houdini, add more roads, replace these roads and so forth okay so looks like we do have a little bit of an issue um, i need to rebuild my grass material so before i did anything i quickly made sure i had my entire region loaded um, 
also I rebuilt my grass maps just now just to make sure that my grass will spawn properly I resaved everything and let's try to click play and assuming everything is working correctly now I should not have any grass on my roads there we go so yeah here we go so now we have a fully built world and we can go ahead and play in it <laughs> so yeah I mean I have a lot of fun just building this stuff um, so I'm wondering what you guys are gonna make with this if you are interested um, go ahead to the discord channel and you can drop your work there like show me what you're making what variety you're making I always like to see what other people are doing with my tools okay so let's go to the slides and let's finish this up because at this point we're pretty much done all right so at this point we're done with the workshop um, I know this is quite a long video so if you've been following along great you should now be able to use the tool properly and at this point um, I just want to say a couple last things mainly that if you want to get updates about the um, toolkit or the roadmap you can go to my website at eudiniacademy.com slash massive worlds this site should be online shortly if it isn't already um, then we also have my patron page of course if you want to get latest updates on the tool set you'll have to go there also, I have a masterclass available for Houdini called the Foundation Module. I have more modules in the works. Um, that's been a bit on hold over the past year, but I am going to pick that back up very shortly. And then if you want to join me, you can join the Discord community. And of course, if you're a patron, you also have access to the patron channels and the student channels. And finally, um, this would not have been possible if it wasn't for my patrons okay I mean they get all these benefits but they also give me feedback support testing and they ask requests and one of the reasons I made this tool set is because my patrons were asking for a open world tool set how to build roads how to make landscapes etc so it's thanks to them that we got to this point now I just want to thank side effects and everything procedural for hosting this workshop and other than that Thank you for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next workshop. Have a good one.